We need to get this meeting started. Thank you very much for your attendance. Um, out of respect to our treaty partners, I will start with a karakia. Mata Fakapono, Mata Tumanako, Mata Ata Titaro, Mata Fakarongo, Mata Manamanu, Mata Ate Aroha, Kataya Mata, Kataya Tato. Um, Kotakupi to Kupu, Kotiatua Tiatua, Kuranga Nui Kirunga, Kupapatuni Kiraro, Kamata Aita Tangata, Kapo Ka Ao, Ka Awatea, Tia Maurior. All right, I personally do not, I had, do have one apology for lateness, that's Ani, she's on council business and she's in the building, but she did indicate that she may be late. I have no other apologies myself. Does anyone else have? Councillor Ria. Sorry? Apologies from Councillor Ria. Thanks for that. Um, just just uh, a notification, it would be handy if apologies did come to the chair, because you know, if, if we get an indication first, it's probably the best avenue for an apology, just to keep that in mind. All right, so Councillor Ria, an apology, and Councillor um, for moved by Councillor Salt, second by Councillor Foster. All those in favour? Against carried. All right, let's go to declarations of interest. No indications there. Confirmation of the non-confidential minutes. Page four. Any matters arising? There's nothing there. Do I have a mover and a second for those minutes? Moved by Councillor Farihinga and seconded by Councillor Telfer? No. Oh, okay, sorry. Councillor. Gregory, thank you. All those in favour? Against? Carried. No leave of absence. Acknowledgements and tributes, the none indicated. No public input and petitions and no extraordinary business. So we'll get straight into it. Page six, we've got the transfer of ownership of the Inner Harbour Wharf Shed Bond Store. <laughs> You'll be sick of me. <laughs> so the um, Inner, Inner Harbour Wharf Shed, otherwise known as the Bond Store, you've probably all driven past this building on Hirini Street. Um, yes, old derelict looking building. So where we're at with that building, as I've set out in my paper, Council assumed ownership of that building around 2016 as part of the Wharf Redevelopment Works. In 2018, the building was moved theoretically on a temporary basis to what was supposed to be Eastland Ports land, but has now transpired to be half on their land and half on private land. So that was a bit of an oops. Um, it was recognised as a bit of an oops at the time. In 2019, Council tried unsuccessfully to dispose of the building via a, um, a public expressions of interest process, and we had no takers for that. So flip forward to the end of last year when this came back onto our radar, we are aware that we have a building that is owned by council that we had promised that we would dispose of. Um, there have been conversations with Nati Aoneone and they had agreed to take ownership of the building. They had previously expressed a vague interest in it, but they didn't formally enter the expression of interest process at that time. But they have subsequently confirmed to us that, as previously discussed with, with Council, they were quite happy to take the building for the sum of $1. So what I um, am, what we are seeking from Council today is just um, your authorisation to proceed with that transfer of ownership as previously agreed with them. Any questions? <laughs> okay, let's go. Hang on, get me a piece of paper out here. <laughs> Councillor Telfer. Yeah, um, in that agreement to take ownership for a dollar, is that agreeing to remove the building at the cost as well? So we still need to work through with them on that. Um, the, the previous conversations with council was that council would undertake um, various works to ascertain what was required for removal. 
for example, whether the building has asbestos in it or not. It is unlikely that it has asbestos given the, the type of building that it is and it's, it's unlined and the, and, and the age of it. So we're anticipating that there won't be a lot of cost in respect of asbestos survey. Um, we are uncertain at this point in time what the deal, you know, what, what, what the arrangement is with Ngāti Aoniani in respect of, of paying for the removal of the building. So are you saying that there is an arrangement with them? There is no arrangement with them. No, we, no we, arrangement? No. We, we haven't confirmed with them that they will remove the building at their cost. Nor have we undertaken that we will remove it at council's cost. Councillor Thompson. Uh, yeah, my, my question was along the same lines. Did, did we have an estimation of demolition cost? The way I read that, they're probably expecting us to demolition it and seek the timber is the way I sort of read it. We, we do have an estimate of demolition costs, but they're somewhat now out of date. They dating from 2019, um, and the cost around that time is around $30,000. Assuming a specific survey, it was part of that. All right, uh, Councillor Robinson. Um, have we had any indication of the cost to move it anywhere? Um, we do have, again, some old costs for removal. Um, that was quite similar to demolition costs. In fact, slightly higher because if you remove and then rebuild, there's a higher cost to just demolition and, and scrap, essentially. So that, that price indication was off in 2019? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of companies relocating houses into Gisborne. So mm -hmm. they have the facilities here at that time. Um, having relocated two houses myself, um, there's some pretty amazing skill sets and there's pretty competitive markets. It'd be interesting to know where the prices for moving now are actually more favourable than then. And particularly when the units are here, then they've got time capacity to something, move something within the city and then... Yeah, the, the, the particular issue with this structure now is council never had a plan for what to do with it in terms of relocating it mm. to a council area and doing something with it that, you know, that horse, I suppose, has somewhat left the stable um, because that wasn't done when the building was initially came into council ownership in 2019. Good what we point. have now is a building that was is, was last um, structurally assessed around 2016, was in somewhat poor repair in 2016 and has had no remedial work done subsequently. So the building, you know, without redoing those condition assessments, the building at this point is really only fit for adapt, you know, demolition and adaptive reuse of its parts. Maybe. Well, you don't have a report to say that, do you? We do have a report to say that. It's yes. only good for demolition. Yeah, yeah. So the, we, we, we have a report that gave, gave council three options, which was do nothing, leave it where it is, which isn't a feasible option because it's not on our land. And the sale and purchase agreement that council, council entered into with Eastland Port was that it would be there on a temporary basis only. So leaving it where it is isn't, isn't really a feasible option. The other option was remove and adaptive, uh, was remove for, for repurposing. Um, on that basis, council ran a expression of interest process to see if anyone was willing to do that. That process did not result in an interested party saying they were willing to do that. We now basically, what we have still on the table is option three, as I would suggest to you really the only feasible option, given the condition of the building, is for removal and adaptive reuse of its parts. And, and that is what Ngāti Oni Oni have, have agreed to, to, to do with the building. So sorry, you're saying that the current agreement with Ngāti Oni Oni is to actually demolish the building? To demolish the building and, the and, to, and to reuse the timbers, to reuse the parts. And which that's still, based upon a, plan, a report which is dated when? Sorry? The report that that recommends that is dated from when? 2020. So no one's been and assessed it in the last four years? Not really, no. Or three years, sorry. Okay, three years. You. Okay, thank you, Councillor Robinson. Uh, I've got uh, Councillor Parata next, please. Morning. Morning, uh, um, just want to mihi to our chair for the karakia this morning. Um, can I ask through you, Mr. Chair, if the Māori Responsiveness Unit is in the room? I can't see them here. 
Okay, Kapa, um, I just wanted to make some comments and, and then ask a couple of questions. Um, the the report itself reads like we don't want to deal with it. Ngati Onione can and should deal with it. Um, so I just want to be mindful mindful about about that. Um, that there will be costs incurred um, to knock it down, and and we didn't want to do that. Um, and it would have been cost to council, and I understand that. I just hope that moving forward, we might look at a solution that will benefit both Ngati Onione and meet our responsibilities to looking after it, considering that we never had a plan for it in the past then going forward we don't want to just move the problem on to Ngati Onione for them to deal with that's not really being a good treaty partner. Thank you. Kia ora, Councillor Parata, it's Nadine here. Um, so yeah, I uh, hear your concerns and certainly if this was to go nowhere, Council would have to absorb costs to move it somewhere at our own expense. So with that um, in mind, we would have accrued any cost anyway. So we will look at that in terms of that um, next steps uh, pending council's decision. Thank you, Councillor Farahin. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm, I'm happy for us to progress conversations with Ngāti Oni Oni, um, taking into account things like that Councillor Parata has, um, has signaled, just to kind of give it some history, you know, Māori have a, have, have this legacy of, um, of organizations giving, wanting to find a place to give them their old stuff, their secondhand stuff, you know, and this can come across like that. So it's really heartening to hear from our CE that actually if there was gonna be a cost center, we would have to do the mahi, we would have to bear the cost. We may as well also allocate that in order to be able to help um, our whanau who are willing to actually do this on behalf of us in the region. I remember when we first uh, had this corridor about who would like this building. Nobody wanted this building, you know. Um, and it's it's great that um, and without assuming too much, and I haven't heard from Ngāti Oni Oni, but the, in my mind, I'm imagining that they're, they're wanting to repurpose the timber that's in there to give it life again, you know. And I'm quite excited by that. Um, so I'm, I'm more than happy to to move this paper um, that that uh, Ngāti Oni Oni gets this gets this building for one dollar because they're doing the the region a service and this council a service actually by repurposing something that has just been sitting there derelict that we've had no plan for for a very very long time so more than happy to move this paper thank you council but again uh council Gregory. <clears throat> thank you i just wanted to check go back a step um and ask why council bought uh, took that building to start with, took ownership of that building. And then my second question is, so we then had a report, a consultant's report done in 2020, which looks like it was a going to come in front of council, but it never did. What, what happened there? I just want to check those two things. So in res sorry, I can respond yeah. to the first part. So the previous chief executive entered into negotiations for a land swap um, with the port. So it involved the works building and then there was a sum that uh, an undisclosed amount which we'd have to get to you um, that we ended up settling on. And part of it was also the offer and the acceptance of the bond shed as a, as a prop up basically in terms of that negotiation. That's how it arrived. Um, with the council. <clears throat> and, in, and in respect to that other paper, which is appended to this report through the docs on tap thing, I understood that that, that did go to the Sustainable Tairawhiti yeah. Committee yeah. around that time. I, that predates me. I don't know if anyone was on yeah, that no, committee yeah. at that time and can recall that paper. So what was that decision? That was just a, a, a noting paper, um, and 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 the, the decision by council at that time was to then proceed with the expressions of interest process. So on that basis, council did the, the EOI to try and get rid of the building. From memory, there was one expression of interest that fell over. I think it was going to be shifted down by the information centre. There was some indication that that might happen, but it, it just didn't get any traction, and I don't think it, it will. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Foster. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I do remember vividly this, this shed and this issue. Um, I was around at the time with um, Councillor Branston. And um, you know, its heritage value was, um, potential heritage value was recognised hugely because it was actually the first dwelling that was ever on the port. Um, so, and possibly one of the earliest dwellings um, re European um, to be built in the area as well. So, yeah, it, had, it had, did have huge um, well, potential for being a heritage, and it was um, going to be a heritage too, um, that, but that um, got that decline. And I, unfortunately, I think the corrugated line probably doesn't help the, uh, the look of it. I mean, I drive past it every day, and uh, um, yeah. Um, my question is, have, have the owners of the half the land that it's sitting on that we didn't realise was on private land, have they, um, are they pressuring us to get rid of it as fast as possible, or is there a bit of a leeway there? Rates, yeah. Rates, so, they're yes. not paying rates, that's they're, right. They're, yeah. they're, 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 they're not paying <laughs> rates on the basis that council yeah, is that, illegally a, occupying the land that we are. We're yeah. accepting that as quite a reasonable position on their part. Really. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I, um, I certainly... Um, share the sentiment of um, uh, Councillor um, Parata and, and um, saying uh, about, um, you know, with Ngāti Onioni not bearing all the, um, the burden of this building. I mean, it's really good of them to be able to take the wood on because the wood is actually you know, amazing. It's some of the, you know, it's some of the probably be most beautiful beams and everything you'll ever mm. see around the place and the history of them. So to see that we live in carvings would be absolutely awesome. So, yeah. yeah. Um, just for clarity around the rates, they are still being billed though, so there's no arrangement that they should not pay rates, is that the case or? We've remitted the rates. Yes. Um, they are still being billed rates, but we are remitting mm -hmm. their rates. There's an, there's a, so they're still a being formal, yeah. formal remission. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I have been in touch with the landowners to tell them that we are aware that Council has a building on that land and that we are seeking to remedy that issue. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Alder. Thank you, Chairman. Um, <clears throat> yes, there are bound to be some beautiful timbers in there, and uh, there's no doubt Ngāti Oni Oni will be getting it for a real gift if we then pay for the demolition. Um, I think, you know, I feel remiss as a Chairman, as a, as a Councillor, <laughs> for not having put enough work into this. And I think this is an example, of, I'd like to use this as an example for getting a document delivered on late Friday afternoon. This is something I would have liked to have visited, um, talked to a number of people around town who were into wood, um, and even perhaps some, some of my Manatuki tribal um, friends, Māori um, out there, whether they would be interested in some of the wood. Um, so again, I just think we, and, and this is an isolated paper could have been handed to us a lot earlier to mull over. Um, so my thoughts on it are, you know, have we thought about putting it out to tender again um, to see if there are any other interested parties out there? Uh, you know, cost of building supplies have skyrocketed in the last four years. Um, that would be my comment. My personal take on that is it has been out there for a long time and we've been through a, a process where there was no indications. It would be unfair now that we have publicised a dollar and a, and a commitment to go one way that we suddenly went through the process again. I don't think that would be fair on anyone. No. It's unfortunate that you haven't been around the table for these discussions, but they have been going for many years. It, it's not being sold for a dollar, though, is it? That's we've got to establish that. Yeah, it's been. It's actually going to cost us. Okay, and I had. I think everyone that's had a first. Go, uh, uh, yep, I'm just going through the first go first, and then second round. There's no one else, so we've got Councillor Robinson and Councillor Parata. Thank you. Um, for me, the recommendation doesn't solve the problem, um, and, and the, so. In relation to um, response to Councillor Alder's point just then, the third paragraph above the recommendation does say that Nati Oni Oni have confirmed as of January 23 that as far as they understood, the building is owned by them, which I am infer is due to the agreement of a $1 purchase. So we have in kind an agreement to pass ownership of that structure to Nati Oni Oni. I think no one in this room would agree that we should pass it, particularly in light of the quarter that's been had so far, that we should pass it Nati Oni Oni are then inheriting the massive cost of demolition. How I see it is that we are 
giving Ngāti Onianu, for the price of a dollar, the timbers within. And that is wholly appropriate in my, in my view, given their manu whenua. Council should not be past this recommendation. The recommendation should read that council will demolish at its cost the, the building, and as we have heard from the CE, and that the timbers and structures will be passed in Atuone for the price of a dollar. That is what we intend to, that's the end game, right? That's what we want to happen. But this recommendation is just going to be a step towards that then having to be resolved somehow, somewhere down the path. We should pass a recommendation which actually achieves the end goal, which is transferring ownership of those timbers, Ngāti Onione, and us dealing with the problem. Otherwise, we're going to have another hui. Someone's going to be trying to work out what happens with the building and the landowner and everything else. We should just take that on the chin now. We should accept we're going to demolish it and pass ownership on to Ngāti Onione. And I, I would put forward a recommendation if that's what we agree to today. Okay, uh, we had Councillor Parada. Yeah. Um, whoops, low on my head. Kapai, I just wanted to also respond um, in, in regards to, you know, putting this back out to tender and potentially talking to Rungo Fukata about them, why they might be interested. But um, where the building is, Ngāti One One is mana whenua, so it wouldn't make sense um, that everyone has already had the opportunity to tender for the building and to express their interests. It makes sense to have this relationship with Ngāti One One. It is on their whenua in terms of their tribal boundaries. So sometimes we have to think about how the decisions we make um, fit into te ao Māori, and that's kind of why in this space that makes sense. Um, I think that, that this is a conversation about partnership. What can we as council do? And what can Ngāti One One themselves, what can they do? I'm not expecting that council take on the full relationship or the full cost, but how can we meet them halfway? How can we be a good treaty partner? And how can we consider how they might meet their aspirations and how we might meet our needs? So, yeah, goodbye. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. And we get Councillor Fari again. Um, the first, I wanted to check, Councillor Parata, did you want to second my um, uh, my motion? It's already, oh, it's oh, already sorry, been sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't realise that. Um, I, I did just want to respond in regards to um, um, us changing the recommendation to be about us um, demolishing the building. That takes it for me. That takes it one step too far. That means that council is now making a decision on behalf of Ngāti on and I think that's one step too far, that we should be having a conversation with Ngāti Oni Oni about their future aspirations for this building. And, and this is the first part in order to be able to enable that dialogue between our, our treaty partners. Um, we've, again, councils, government organisations have made mistakes in the past by going too far and presuming what the decisions are that iwi mana whenua are going to make. Um, I'm, I, the, the end point may exist, be exactly where the, the, the same place that um uh, that Councillor Robinson is talking about. It's but it's how we get there, and it needs to be uh, the way that we get there is by having a open and shared dialogue with our with our iwi partners. I, I think it's just too far. So I'm not willing to change my my recommendation. Okay, no, some good points there. No one else. So it looks like go three for. Oh, yeah. okay, Councillor Thompson, and then Councillor Robinson. Yeah, I'm just gonna back back what he said. Okay. Sounds, sounds yeah. good. Uh, you, Robinson. My only concern is with the recommendation, and I hear what you're saying, Councillor Farihinga, is that technically our obligation, once they own it, our legal obligation to do something with that building ends. And we don't really progress the relationship with the with the landowner because now Ngāti Oni Oni owns a building on this chap person's land. So the other option is we leave it lie on the table. We have some up-to-date corridor with Ngāti Oni Oni, ascertain their aspirations for the building, bring this back in, two months time and say, yep, they've actually said they want just the timbers, they don't want the hassles in the structure and blah, blah, blah. And then we, we put a different recommendation because I don't, I think we're just passing the buck here and creating more problems for ourselves down the, down the track. Thank you. Yes, Stoltz. The fact that we are making a decision to um, pass this over today and this whatever that we are having is open and free and frank. I would hope that as a council, we are, Good treaty partners and if we pass this today and we know there are still some work to be done or some conversations to be had the fact that we pass a resolution today the resolution that's on the table I fully expect our staff 
to have the discussions moving forward because the intent of what I heard today or how we are speaking and the questions we are asking, we absolutely want to have those discussions and we have to ask ourselves, do, is it that we just want to make a decision and dump that on Ngāti Oni Oni? No, that's not what we want to do. The intent of this council is to work in partnership. So the decision that we are making today is a first step and what Chris and, and Michelle has indicated is that those discussions would carry on. I would hope that if we make a decision today, that we don't, uh, that, that, that the expectation is there and the, the intent that we are making here today, the, the spirit around the table is a good intention and we do want to do it the right way. So I'm very comfortable with what was being passed. I hear what you're saying, Councillor Robinson, 100%. I would hope, and um, I, I, I shouldn't say I would hope, I know this council would do the right thing and moving forward. So I'm very comfortable with what we are um, passing here today. And this is why I'm comfortable seconding this because I know the good intention behind what staff are trying to achieve here and also us working alongside our partner, partner Nati Oni Oni, to do the right thing. Thanks for that. I'm feeling ready to put it, but I do have the a comment from Michelle. So th through the chair, we have every intention of working as good treaty partners. And as uh, you'll note in the report as next steps, council staff, and uh, we know council staff will initiate work with Ngāti Ōnōni to progress formal transport to and ownership and removal of building from site. So we have every intention of working alongside Ngāti Ōnōni on this. And we are already in a um, significant dialogue with them um, about this process. Thanks for that. Morina Tato. Um, does the council intend to indemnify Ngati Union in, in relation to any responsibilities to the landowner? They would be already indemnified, would they not? Yes, yeah, so through yeah. um, through the chair, uh, the building is still council's property uh, and until it transfers over. Um, that will be the date within which all responsibility would sit with Ngāti Oni Oni. So there is no um, liability with them and we would ensure that we have transferred the property building at the time um, with, with those appropriate caveats around um, who is responsible and liable up until that point. Um, but I do also just want to reinforce that Michelle um, holds the operational uh, relationship with Ngāti Oni Oni. They meet Regularly, we have a very positive relationship. These discussions have been ongoing, and we certainly would not leave them with any significant any costs um, as a result of this um, transfer. All right, thank you. I think it's been uh, around the table a couple of times, so I'm quite happy to accept the moving by Councillor Perry Parihinga and the seconded by Mayor Stoltz. All those in favour? Aye. Against? Carried. Did you want that recorded or not? No. All right, so we go on to page let's see, page <coughs> thirteen. Thank you. <clears throat> yep. Community occupancy policy. So, as I mentioned to you guys yesterday, um, I luckily hold the portfolio of work around our community sorry, my, my. sorry our community leases and licenses um, when I started here with council towards the end of last year or August last year um, Michelle had identified that council we didn't have a very we didn't have good policies and systems and processes around how we manage this portfolio of work so what we've been working on is drafting up a policy to do deliver two things. Firstly, to deliver some consistency in the way that we consider and issue and manage community occupancies. Um, and secondly, to try and maximize and optimize the community benefit that, arise, that arises out of these occupancies that we have on council land. This policy is in a, in a draft form. The next step of our, the process that we're intending is to go out and consult with our key, key stakeholders. So this is a, you know, a, a, a 
a select number of our existing community occupancies and tangata whenua and some of our sporting organisations. Just to socialise with them the mechanisms that we're proposing here, particularly around um, our assessment mechanism, if you like, for assessing social benefit of community occupancies, and then secondly, the proposed fee regime. So in this paper, I've, I've outlined those two things to you. Um, firstly, our mechanism for determining social benefit, and then secondly, our proposed fee mechanism. So the fee mechanism, there are three, there are three perhaps more potential options. What we are proposing to go forward and consult on, and what we are just wanting you to be aware of, because this is, that, this is our recommended option, is that the, the process that council will apply will be a determination of market rate. So we will start by working out what is a potential market rate, and then council will subsidize or apply a subsidy or a waiver to commercial rental, depending on the level of social benefit that, 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 that we consider arises from that particular activity. Um, yep. Yes. Uh, that's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, the, the, my initial concern was the complexity of the assessments and that, but it's still, I, I don't have an answer to it. So I think we've, it's something we've got to run with and make it work. Um, we've always had a concern of handling people different, mm. you know, it's sort of coming here and making different decisions where we do need to get some balance into it. So I think this goes a long way toward that. Mm. Anything else, anyone? Yeah, Councillor Robinson. Couple of questions. I did pick up in the report, but where did you think under the proposed um, matrix current prices would land? Uh, can you just show me the paragraph which says what the sort of um, average increase or decrease or overall position will lie. Will it be much par for what we've got now? Or will there be a 5%, 7%, 95% increase? Yeah, so as I've said in the paper, um, at this point in time, it is difficult for us to meaningfully model what a social benefit analysis might result in terms of rentals, because the process that we design is we go and talk to groups. So you tell us what your, you know, you know how, how you score, how you see yourselves in terms of community benefit, and then council we make an, an, an assessment of that. In the absence of even going and talking to community groups to try and understand from them how they see their social benefit, that becomes a purely intellectual exercise on my part, or my team's, you know, our team's part, that we can't model in any kind of meaningful way. But almost certainly, given the spectrum of rental that we have across the portfolio, which as I've pointed out in this paper, ranges from $1 to 14000 this, the, the, this assessment, because it will now be a tribute, it will be attached to a degree of market, uh, market rental as a starting point, will increase the, 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 the lower spectrum of the community, community occupancies. So basically under this model, unless you're, you're, you have an exceptional circumstance, people would be unlikely to be paying $1 a year using this tool. People who are currently paying a lot more than that if they can now, they now have an opportunity to say to us that our community benefit is actually so vast, their rental and their, their rental might in fact decrease. Across the board, across the board, we don't see this as a net decrease to what council is currently receiving in terms of rental, um, but in terms of an increase, very difficult for me to model with any degree of accuracy for you. So my concern is that the, the baseline here is going to be the market rental discounted. Yeah. And, and we have not, you, you literally just said, you have no idea how that might pan out. So the example of the highest um, leaseholder at the moment is what, 17,000 per annum. But it might be the market rental for that place is in fact 50,000. Oh no, I, so, so, so market rental, um, I suppose we could go away and model what the potential market rental is. So I misunderstood your question. I thought you were asking market rental if we discount it, what it might look like. Hmm. We could potentially go away and try and model what market rental would be, but that's assuming that, well, I mean, we, we could do that over the 130 to 140 odd leases we have, could possibly model what, what market rental would be. So I understood it to be the market rate, right? The report refers to the market rate. So are we not going to say under this proposal 
that we'll look at the market rate for that property. Yes. And then we will apply a matrix a waiver, that's right. uh, up to a rating of four and we'll discount you accordingly. Yeah. And my, my concern is we do not, you have not been able to tell us what the market uh, scenario will look like. In and, terms of a dollar value or in terms yeah, because, of an assessment mechanism? No, as, in terms of dollar value, because the market, I have to assume since those prices were set, the market has gone up significantly. Some of those prices have probably been set a decade ago, maybe longer. And so the starting baseline for this new scenario has to be significantly higher than what was the reality in setting those prices initially, unless those prices have been linked to inflation or, or, or reviews annually, which if a dollar is a dollar, that's not obviously linked to anything. So I'm really concerned that we'll be passing this and we don't actually know what the landscape's going to look like. And we might get to a point where the market rates will go, crikey dick, We've actually got three or four million dollars worth of market rate property and we've now proposed a policy that will start at a 90 percent discount for those who are really rocking but that's still going to be paying 30 or 40 thousand when they're currently paying 800 and, and without knowing that information i think we're really floundering in the dark i think that needs to come back to us before we can make an informed decision that was my first point my second point is um i don't you've touched on iwi partnership Māori in there um i would like to have seen some more information as to how that might flesh out those are my two points. Can I just um, get some clarity around that market rate? Um, the way I'm seeing it is we're looking at their market, not the market rate for rental. We're looking at a market price based on community facilities. So their market is going to be way lower than the market price, if you like. So market rate is an assessment of the rateable value of the land. Oh, so it is so, that market. So we have we have you know we have a rateable value across all our land. The land that we administer as reserve, which is the bulk of these occupancies, would arguably have a different market rate than you know a different rateable value than 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 no, than, so than my property. Mm, okay. Uh, Councillor Parihinga. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Just to, just to clarify where you're bringing this paper to us about a draft policy that you're planning on engaging with the community. That, that's, that's correct? Yes. Okay. Um, when you go out to the community, because I, I've, I think I, I share the same concerns as Councillor Robinson, when you go out to the community, will you model what this would possibly look like for our, for our stakeholders in regards to um, the, this, this figure uh, or, or what the what the policy may end up um, impacting yeah, uh, how it may end up impacting financially is, is that going to be part of the the engagement process that is the intention i okay. think we need to get uh, accurate uh, information so that these stakeholders can understand the implications of this and we can get that accurate feedback on um, what that does mean for these communities and also just just noting that this is a draft and this is for discussion this is not a decision yes. that needs to be made today yeah um and the the yeah I, I i think that's great i do share i do share concerns but like at my what i'm hoping that that will do is actually inform our community engagement process i think that if we spoke to our community about um them carrying things like pan charges, water charges, that the, the council charges and, and, and things like that. I, I, I can't think of any community organization that would expect uh, the, the rate payer to carry those. And they'll be more than happy to contribute in regards to that. Um, it would be great if that uh, became also part of, the, of, our, of our community engagement process. Um, I, just to clear, I am a, a anxious about this you know have, have been a person that has come from community uh in regards to the potential financial impact but we i feel like we do need to have this conversation uh, we, we need to start outside of the conversation and we need to be open to hearing what the feedback is from community in order to shape uh what this policy document will finally be um yeah so I'm, i do support us having this conversation, just anxious about next steps and really keen on you guys keeping us engaged in regards to where we go to next. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Parahinga. Councillor Parata. Um, oh, everyone's gone. 
Oh, hello. Sorry. Um, I, I, I like that actually that we're having this this conversation and I think it's an important conversation to have. Um, and I agree that not one not one size fit all fits all and, and that idea of a flat rate I don't think works for um to tie it up at sea considering um the diversity that we have here. I really, really like that. We're starting to think more about um benefits and social benefits and community benefits as well as economic benefits and those things should weigh out so um really just want to mihi to to staff and to the paper because every time i see um the word equitable um and for that that to be um thought about in, in terms of what it is we do and how it is we um charge and support people how it is we make money i think that that's an important conversation to have and one that our community um would really benefit from. Um, I have, yeah, have sort of the same concerns, I think, as um, Councillor Robinson in terms of, you know, that market market rent and, and making sure that in the cases where we should be getting we should be getting um, a higher amount that we're getting that, that that the conversation about affordability is there and that it's balanced with the benefit to community. But I can see this paper is attempting to do that. So really, I just wanted to make it to it. Thank you for that. Councillor Foster. Thank you. It would have been quite good to have some examples of what already um, has been charged. But, um, you know, I kind of, I think about area and I, I, you know, first off, I think of the park golf course and the area there and its value and um, and what they're paying and then um, rugby park you know and harry barker reserves our Puni stadium you've got all these huge areas so is an area the um area of the of the um location of uh, of the um clubs that are paying are that, is that going to be taken into consider, in, uh, you know, consideration as well i mean you know the you know, the other side is that you know, we've got to be mindful of, of these clubs and the benefit to the area, but we've also got to be mindful to our ratepayer of what um, what's potentially they are not receiving from this land as well. Um, so there's a there's a balance, you know. And um, at the moment we've we've got from a dollar <laughs> to fourteen thousand for, and I don't think you know when you look at them, none of them are equitable whatsoever. They've just done at a time, at a point in time. Well, that was fine for that particular point of time but now we've inherited um you know, quite a nightmare i should imagine when we start reassessing and um, um approach uh, apportioning different methods to um you know to, to um, charge the periods <coughs> so yeah it's it's um it's not going to be an easy process and um you know I, I would like to um see some examples of what what's possible and what what the scenario could be because we're going to have to consult with each every one of the clubs, and most of them are going to be saying, "Well, hey, we can't afford that," or you know. So yeah, um, I, I look with interest. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Councillor Thompson. Yeah, out of those options, I'm probably swayed the most towards option one. Uh, yeah, pretty much just repeating the others. The notes I've got um, is um, community groups sort of need a clear indication of new costs that's the one question they're going to be asking what what will we be paying so i think they need a clear indication what their new cost will actually be and i, I like the point on page 19 uh it's number 26 where, where we've got consideration for exceptional circumstances and financial hardship so that, that gives us discretion we're not just ticking boxes all right yeah michelle I just wanted to add that um, a fundamental part of this, um, the development of this policy is about um, supporting community groups to get to a more sustainable place themselves. A large number of groups do have um, facilities and assets where, um, and with declining volunteer numbers, where it is really challenging to um, retain that sustainability. So having these conversations and um, and working with the uh, community groups through this process will actually, and we hope will start to trigger some of those conversations about a more sustainable future, um, combined, combined use of facilities, uh, making sure that um, maximizing the ability of um, the, the community to come in and use them. So, so that is the intention. Thank you. Councillor Robinson. Oh, Councillor Talbot hasn't spoken on this matter. So. Yeah, look, I'm, um, I'm at this stage, I'm in, in favour of um, uh, number one because 
I think, you know, it's a draft and let's go go out and take this out and see what the community feedback will it. Because um, we've got to move with the times and um, rentals for any club of a dollar, I'm afraid, is way out of touch and it doesn't give them any incentive to look after themselves and try. It's amazing what what groups can fundraise and and get stuff done when they want to, um, upgrading club rooms, whatever it is. So, so look, I think you've got to have something, you've got to have a starting point that is going to be able to be moved with the times and I think this option gives you that. So. Thanks, mate. You're dropping off, Councillor Robinson? Oh, yeah, you can, you can. I was just going to <laughs> ask a question of um, Ms. Pry. Pry? Free? Pry. Pry. Um, how does this proposed policy um, encourage sustainability court at all? Sorry. You're saying like, well, actually, if you look at yourselves, you're not really sustainable because your rental is now going to be so high. You should probably just roll your roll your club up now and maybe go and share someone else's building. Is that really what you're saying? So this is all about that conversation and the application of that social um, benefit matrix. So having the conversation about um, user numbers and uh, and also other uh, like so the community need for the facility uh, numbers um, other factors uh, that they can then start to think and reflect themselves about um, about their social benefit and the amount that they're offering to the community uh, because the, the social benefit uh, is, a, is a significant factor so if you've got one for example one uh, club who uses a facility once a week for one hour um, and it's closed off from the wider community for the rest of that week um, that is of um, and, and being honest, that is uh, of less value to the wider community and the ratepayer than a facility that might be uh, used five nights a week by four different clubs and uh, is a more sustainable um, financial model as well in terms of various groups contributing to the overall running of that facility. Just supplementary, I, I hear what you're saying. I'm a little uncomfortable that this could be seen as a mechanism for achieving that conversation. It's that's in my view, council stepping into the community group saying, hey, you know, take a look at yourself. Um, is there really a place for you in this community? I, I'm a little uncomfortable. I know I know what you're saying. It's about rationalization and about, but if we're going to put the blowtorch under a club through this mechanism financially, I don't I'm not particularly comfortable with that. Okay. Uh stops. I see absolutely no blowtorches being out at all. What I'm seeing is a community discussion which is needed where we are going out because this paper is really broad. What we are saying as a noting paper today is saying our staff has identified that there's a need to go out and talk and ask, see what the community impact, see what, are being, what is being paid. Is it fair? And they will come back to us. Our staff know that community groups in our region play a massive role so and they know that we care for that and we want those in our community so the last intention of our staff would be to try and make community clubs feel like we are there to ask them to shut down or put costs up that absolutely make it unaffordable for them to operate that's the reason we have remission policy so i support this because i can see this lines up with our discussions yesterday it's a governance discussion on what we have. Is it still fit for purpose? We know it isn't. So let's go out and make sure we get the community voice in there. It's not us making decisions and saying, this is how you should operate, but you shouldn't operate like that. So for me, Kapai, I want you to bring those community voices back to us, and then we balance it with the money and the impact on our community. And we make decisions with all of that in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Did you have something else, Councillor Thompson, and then Councillor Robinson? Yeah, I just want to compliment you on this paper. When you look at other councils, other councils haven't taken this step. So we're leading the way for other councils. So I compliment you on your bravery, bringing this forward and taking that step and leading the way instead of following other councils. So yeah, I'd like to uh, thank you. Option thank one. You. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I support number one, um, but the, the emphasis for me is transparency <laughs> and that um, this process must be visible 
by everybody for everybody so that we can see who is getting what in the subsidy. In a perfect world, I think it would be nice if we could charge everybody market rates and uh, lean on our very wealthy, very magnanim magnanimous partners, Trust Tarafati, to pick up the tab of um, supplementing the cost, which, and I mentioned that because, because I think that should also be part of the matrix and that some of those clubs will be benefiting from Trust Tarafati already, and some may not even know about Trust Tarafati. So in your, in your moving around these people, I think that needs to be mentioned or brought into the equation. Thank you. Okay, uh, Councillor Pahu Kuruwe. Thank you, Chair, and apologies for lateness. I just want to echo, echo Teddy's sentiments about the work that's been done uh, thus far. So thank you, ladies. Um, also, uh, support option one. Um, and I, I think, you know, but not just that I saw the list of, of groups, but to get a broader perspective on broader community groups and what they're paying um, and clubs and things for rental, to get a, a broader understanding of what are, what are clubs associated to council and not um, paying typically as um, rental out there that's and, and maybe inquiring also, well, how do they manage? Because most community groups that I know or, or clubs struggle. Um, so what are, where, where are they um, getting that support from to cover their rental? I, I don't know anybody that pays one dollar per annum, no. <laughs> so, yeah. but um, yeah, so I, I support option one, Hilda. Thank you. Thank you, move Councillor Fadi. Are you moving or are you seconding? Seconding. Oh, you want to talk, okay. Councillor Tim. Um, thank you very much for the paper, um, Ms. Frey. Um, appreciate the paper. I have a consideration. I was wondering, because I can't see it anywhere in the think tank model that's been presented in the paper, is how you allow for the space within the thinking. There's a 10% that says social and cultural. And I'm wondering if we take in like the, uh, the, the sort of consideration of what has consistently happened over the years for our Wakaama Club, um, <clears throat> how you make sure in the distribution of your instrument and tool to determine the matrix of decision making, uh, you bring equity about the occupancy uh, policy for Māori interests of uh, cultural activities that are bound in our worldview and actually maintain our worldview through um, the activity like Waka Ama that might want to be done. And I ask this question earnestly because if that's been the concern for our world winning championship organization, then I wonder what's within this particular construct that might make that seem a lot more comfortable and amenable um, for Maori organizations who've proven over time that they've got all the right things that should meet cultural and social benefit for the community and um, the population they benefit to feel like this kind of policy could include them. Now on that, I also want to uh, confirm and affirm the concept of having the modeling done that would show the point that I'm asking to be proven before um, we go uh, to the next set of work that allows it to go into the community then that would mean in the testing amongst the community, you've already considered that in the think tank model of how this might be applied. I hope I made myself clear. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah. All right. Uh, as you can see, I, I have had a mover in Councillor Fadi hanging. I haven't had it seconded. Seconded by Councillor yeah. Gregory. Um, it is just a noting, no, noting report, and that is to give direction to next steps, which I think you've got good indications around the table of uh, how we're thinking. I'd just like to take up Michelle's point about the clubs <laughs> that may use an hour a week. All the time I've been in council, we've discussed hubbing and the inefficiencies of the workings at the moment. So an outcome of this could be that they really do consider that the inefficiencies of how some of the organisations do operate at the moment with one facility per club and that. Hubbing is the way to go, you know, if someone's got a need for two hours, three hours a week for their facility, when potentially there's another 20 out there with the same need, 
they've got to get together at some stage and maybe this approach will incentivize that so so i do see that as a potential outcome so moved by councillor Farahinga, seconded by councillor gregory all those in favor Aye. against carry i think prior to our next meeting we'll have a cup of tea and I'll say, hasta la vista a cinco semana. Okay, morning everybody. Welcome to the infrastructure, operations infrastructure meeting this morning. Uh, welcome Dave Wilson, the director of uh, Lifelines. Uh, so we'll, um, we'll start if everyone's ready. All right, apologies. We have apologies from Councillor Ria. Is there any other apologies? Okay, um, any declarations of interest for this meeting? We've got a great uh, lineup of information coming through today. Really good information, actually, on Gabriel. So, um, any declarations of interest? Uh, just to exclude you from speaking, if it's a pleasure to hear it. Huh? Yeah. 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 Sweet, no worries. Thank you, we'll note that. Um, any, um, we've got confirmation of non-confidential <coughs> minutes, and I've got a alteration here on 10.1, which was um, identified by council order, and I'll re-read it out. Over time, many owners have alleviated issues on their properties, not understanding the adverse effects for the waterways. To try to mitigate this, staff have taken an educational approach through inspections and involved enforcement action if property owners do not reinstate. So that's um, been a change. So that's a change from adverse effects for council to adverse effects for that's water. ten point one. Yeah. yeah. Okay, it was just picked up by. Okay, um, we got any matters arising from the confidential minutes? Council. Um, is it that my point on that bullet point was I couldn't actually understand it because it refers to a lot of owners and I'm not sure quite what the issue was. There was one owner that was at issue, but moving on from that, um, I'd like to note that it was moved by us um, that, prior, uh, that uh, prior we're gonna prioritize the works as needed across the TRI catchment and implement these through the 23-24 plan. I just want to have that noted that it was agreed then that there were. Okay, cool. No okay moving on. Um, confirmation of the non-confidential minutes, 7th of December, 2022. Yep. Okay, leave of absence, there's none. Acknowledgements and tributes, there none of those. Public input and petitions. Oh, sorry, we'll move the minutes. Sorry, yes, I do I have a mover. Councillor Degree, second. Anyone? Oh, thank you, current Council Parada. All in favour? Okay, leave of absence is none. Acknowledgements and tributes, none. Public input and petitions, we have none. Extraordinary business, we have none. That is a motion. And adjourned business, there's none. Reports of the Chief Executive and staff for information. We've got a Cyclone Gabriel update, which um, I just want to commend staff on the report. It's an um, absolutely fantastic report and um, really in depth of what's been going on and um, what's been happening. So I'll pass it over to Dave. Thank you, Dave. So thank That's you. on Chair. page eight. Thank you, Chair. So through through you, we are looking at how we can best update the committee on what's been happening across um, predominantly lifelines and infrastructure. Since Cyclone Gabriel, with the works that we've got underway, um, what happened, what we've done, and what we've still got left to do. 
And we were trying to come up with a way to do that succinctly. Um, as you can see by the report, there's a lot on in a large number of places. So what we'd like to do is work through each of the work areas, if that's all right with the committee, take them as we go. So jumping to sort of the appendices, the attachments there, and just working through. So a number of the team are here. Unfortunately, a number of the team are not here as well. So I'll speak to those sections. But it is just around being able to give you an opportunity for where we're at with things, to ask some questions. Um, hopefully we can answer all of them. I say hopefully because it's a wide area. There's a lot going on. Um, and things do change very quickly with what we've got going on as well. So the other thing we have done is to try and keep things up to date, we've also added in a couple of extra slides just to be able to talk through where things are at um, across the district. So Heather, would you be able to chuck that presentation up for us and we'll start working that through if that's all right with the committee. So the first area um, I'll talk to is around the land rivers and coastal function, um, which is in your report um, at page 12. And this is just around what we've got happening uh, across the district and a lot of work that has been done in the pockets of land rivers and coastal area. And I've also got Joss here to talk through the Waipawa flood control scheme and some of the works that have been up at Mangatuna as well. No, sorry, not Mangatuna, Mangahawini. So one of the first things I just wanted to talk through an update was we know that a number of our drainage districts are hammered at the moment. So across the district, drainage and water tabling is a massive thing that you'll hear us talking about a lot of a lot at the moment. So what the teams have done and a lot of this, so can I just preface a lot of what we'll talk about today. One of the big holdups for us is ground conditions and being able to actually do work across all of lifelines. Everything's really wet. By that I mean we can't put our gear onto land because it will sink. So we have real issues with actually being able to access some things at the moment, but also a number of the crews that we have are also still working on the response. So for us in lifelines, the roading teams are still responding. Civil defense are still responding, so are waste. A number of them are actually. We've still got people that are cut off. We still have people that are using forward crossings or river crossings to access their properties. And Dave from the team will talk to that but also they're still welfare going into some places because they're still cut off too. So it's a mixture of response and recovery. We're trying to trans transition to recovery, but as you'll see with water, they're actually still in response as well, given how fragile everything is up there as well. So for the flood, so sorry, for the drainage schemes on the Poverty Bay Flats, we have been working through assessing those and getting contractors available to go in and start those. So those who actually started this morning. So we've started at Manatuki and at Fotatuna today with the teams going out to start clearing the water tables in the drainage district. So we're aware a number of them are covered in silt um, and a number of them are also blocked. So we've got blocked culverts and we've got blocked um, drains. So we have got teams that have started that now um, and they have started to go through where we can um, to clear out the drains and water tables across our drainage district. So we're doing a full clean out of everything at the moment. One of the issues we do have is ground conditions and for some of our pump stations, we still actually can't get to them with machinery because the silt is still too wet. You can't even walk on it. Um, and we know that we have got some issues with pumps that we're going to need to replace. So we're working about what that's going to look like um, but just to let you know, this is starting today. There's also comms going out as well to the community. So there is a press release that will go out after us telling you this today, which will say what we're doing um, with the drainage districts. This is when you can expect the teams to be coming through, um, just to reassure people that we haven't forgotten it and we know that we're coming into winter. I suppose a big theme for us in Lifelines is we know that we're coming into winter. We start to lose um, construction season. Now it's gone but we're trying to get as much done as we can to prepare for winter as we go through the district. So the second part for us here is for the catchment here at Manatuki is around the Tiaro River. So we've been in there and we've done a number of assessments on foot where we can and by drone where we can't get in um, because of ground conditions there. So we've got five hotspots, and I know it says there's four up there, but there's two under one circle before Council Robinson pulls me up. Um, we have got um, five spots that are there that we've prioritised, and I'll show you those in a second. So those hotspots are where we've got um, debris that has fallen in, um, like we have here. So the house on the right, we've already done, sorry, my right, 
you be all right, Turkey. So um, we've been in and cleared that one there to clear away the debris that's there. Um, the Papatu Road logs is our third priority, I think I said on the slide previously. So we're about to go there. Also, we're at Papatu Road next. Um, but we have issues with getting access there with how wet it is. Then we've got a hot spot behind um, 63 Papatu Road. And then we've also got one um, there by 332 and 300 Wanaki Road. We've gone out and assessed those with the river engineers. Um, we also had one for cars to come along with that um, to discuss where we were going to do the works. A lot of this is driven by the blockages that are there. So this is purely a river engineering assessment with priority. So this is the works that we have available for this financial year. This is the works that we think that we can pull off given the ground conditions and the access issues that we have there as well. So before I leave the Te Aro, um, just quickly, there's a couple of approaches, sorry, there's multiple approaches for the Te Aro. So the first part is getting the debris out that we can between now and winter on these sites that have slipped. The second part is, is looking at the resilience for what we're going to do there as part of the wider picture of what we're looking across the catchments across the whole of the district. Because as you'll see in a second, when we talk about the Mangahawini, the Uawa, the Waipawa, they all have issues that have come from what has happened from Cyclone Gabriel. Cyclone Gabriel has changed the catchments quite significantly. So you've all seen photos and footage of where silt has been deposited, where we've got blockages where we didn't used to have them. The team are working through the LIDAR that we're getting, the surveys that we've done to see what effect that's actually had on the river catchments and the river channels. So the best way, I can, the most obvious example is the Waipawa River when we had that little bit of rain um, last weekend. The river jumped up, not that much, we weren't too worried about it, but the colour of it was very, very dark because the silt was starting to remobilise again. For us, from a river conveyance point of view, that's actually quite a good thing to see it remobilising and seeing things moving. But what we're looking for is what are the changes and then we will bring you a programme of what are the interventions and what's the priority of those. We have to take a district-wide approach to that because there are some communities that have a flood protection service that is there, like the Waipawa on the city side at the moment. We've obviously got some works so that we need to understand what happened at Tikaraka better. We also have the western side that has got only limited protection, but then we, have, we start talking about some of our coast communities like Uawa, there is no protection. The Te Arai has a scheme, but there's actually no flood control scheme there at all. What we want to do is work through those priorities across the district, bring that in with the wider conversation that's happening in recovery, and then give you those priorities as we get from there once we've been able to work through the changes and then what are the risks or opportunities that come out of that as well. And that's a big conversation we need to bring. Joss, do you want me to talk to the Mangahawini quickly while you're coming up? So, so just to give you an idea of the Mangahawini River and the changes that we've had, this drone shot was taken um, January of this year. And what the piece I'd like you to look at in particular is down in here. So in the middle there, have a look at those blue lines and have a look at the difference post Gabriel. So as you can see, that piece there that was grass is now completely gone. So if I flip back to thing two, so there, gone. So just to give you an idea, that's the putter there. Um, State over 35 there, that's the putter. These are the homes further up and back in through there, for those who know the area, that's where the um, church is just off the side up there. So Toa and um, Taro through, through there. So as you can see, it's eaten in meters for what it has happened since Cyclone Gabriel. We did try and do some works in January in the Mangahawini to try and make sure that we were prepared for when we got to there. Um, but as you can see, Gabrielle decided she would do what she would do. Um, and yeah, you can just see some of the erosion and how quickly that cut in. And you can also see um, how close some of these things are on the edges there. Um, that tank that the church has fallen in there. That one or the other one? One of them has. So you can see it is moving quite fast up there in Tokamaru Bay um, and just the catchment and how things are changing up there. So I just have to come back to your slides. Oh, there's your slides coming in. So, sorry, everyone knows Joss. Just checking for the councillors. Uh, yeah, I'll just cover one by one. So the um, 
top left um, is uh, just highlights the, the landslip and um, backing up of water in the um, upper Manga Hawini, which uh, okay. so um, there is uh, or are um, a series of risks related to, to the, the, the the backing up of water behind that, which um, I'm sure um, a lot of you are aware of, as well as the, the material that's been mobilized and will come down and um, have some effect on the, the river booms and, and levels, but uh, that uh, is still being worked through. Um, the top right-hand corner there is um, the Waikakariki um, stop bank breach, which is um, upstream or to the yeah, upstream of uh, Paratahi Town Township. Um, that stop bank has been uh, repaired, temporary first, and then um, with a more uh, long-term fix has been completed now as well, uh, has been resolved. Uh, bottom left is the Waipoa on the western side, um, approximately um, across from Ormond, slightly upstream near um, Humphreys Road. Um, large scour hole developed there um, during Gabrielle, um, damaged the culvert you can see there and um, almost went all the way through the, the stop bank, but uh, luckily held and, and didn't, didn't breach that location. Um, that site has uh, been repaired. Uh, we retreated the stop bank um, away from the river um, to, to bolster and, and return it to the um, a thickness, safe thickness. And then following that uh, work, fully renew the culvert um, that's there. Um, so that's, that work's been completed now. Um, there is just a, a, um, another stage there to delete the existing damaged um, culvert. Um, uncertainty about when we're going to do that. We do need a period of dry weather to, to, to make sure we don't do that properly. Um, and the uh, bottom right hand corner is the Manga Hawini, um, the Kuda um, uh, um, school there on the left hand side, the damage to the netball courts. Um, we have some um, erosion um, protection in place there that uh, sustained um, reasonable damage. Uh, we will be looking to replenish that or repair that using rock armoring, uh, bolster that. Um, it's basically a more significant repair than uh, what's there and hopefully a, a longer term fix. Um, there's also concerns further downstream, um, close to the, the access uh, Moana Road, um, where there's been a bit of erosion um, encroaching that roadway as well. It's also um, I'm getting close to the uh, State Highway Bridge as well over the Monga Hawi. So, any questions on the matter of coastal or coastal schemes? Uh, I've taken the sections, if that's easy for you guys, or do you want to wait to the end? I mean... <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, <laughs> Looking at the pictures, you'd all have to agree that the only river that's got willow trees all the way through its catch, through its basin, is the TRI. Um, we've heard from locals asking for maintenance on this river, um, and it's, it's written in here that the TRI fully overtopped, causing damage and destroying farmland. I'd like it recorded that the TRI had multiple partial dams formed from slash and willows, which contributed to multiple breaches. The river didn't just overtop, it dammed, which caused the breaches. This is something we have to address quickly. Pulling, pulling logs from those few dam sites is a temporary fix. There are, the, the wood is throughout the river, and the willows have fallen over throughout the willow, throughout the river. They will mobilize in the next flood. There'll be more dams forming and more breaches and every possibility of a dam forming on the State Highway Bridge and causing uh, catastrophic damage there. We have to break some rules, get into that riverbed and chop up those willow trees into short lengths have them flushed out, hopefully on a small flush, and they'll wash up on Browns Beach or the immediate area around the river mouth. And I, I'm suggesting that this is the best way to cope with it. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, 
we are still working through the assessments of what's happened on the TRI. So yes, slash and woody debris has been an issue on the TRI and above the TRI all the way up to the Wanaka catchment. There has been debris and there have been logs that have come down and have jammed through there. As per the report last year, we acknowledged that there needs to be maintenance on the TRI. What we put forward was around what we can afford with the budgets that we have to be able to do the works that are there now. We didn't have enough money to clean the TRI River as the committee is aware. We have prioritized works to clean it. However, we are talking about how we prioritize across the whole of the district and the works that need to happen in a number of areas. So we have to bring a report that shows all of the issues across rather than going from one river to another because there are a number of areas that have similar, if not worse catchments than the TRI. So it is one for our consideration to bring forward and we will bring that forward to you with what we are able to get consent for, what we are able to get budget for and what is in the best interest of the catchments. Yep. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I think if we analyse the dollar value damage throughout the entire region, the damage caused by the TRI will be the highest zone of damage anywhere. Thank you. Councillor Faringham. I think the community of Te Karaka and Mahaki would disagree with uh, 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 how much damage has been done and where. Uh, who has the highest amount of damage, yeah. if, if I'm being entirely honest. There are, like you've said, Mr. Wilson, there are lots of different communities who have been massively damaged by, um, by Cyclone Gabriel. And I think if we start trying to have this all about whose damage is more, uh, it, it, it doesn't line us up properly as, as uh, spokespeople for our community. I think we just need to recognise that there's damage everywhere. And I've, I'm, I'm hopeful that the... Uh, that this report that will be coming back to us about that wider strategic view, Mr. Wilson, will be solid and well informed, um, and, and not only include like the, the economic damage, you know, for, for people that are growers on the flats, but also there's there's a lot of uh, trauma damage. There's a lot of infrastructure, housing damage. Uh, there are people that you know, multiple families all living inside uh, one home. We've gone back to like these. Uh, post-COVID uh, stresses where we, we, we have people living, multiple families living on top of each other. I mean, you know, like a, that, those would be the difficult things to be able to quantify in terms of quote unquote damage. So um, just want to recognize that there's a lot, there's a lot out there. Yeah, um, yeah you, you're dead right. It's, um, there's so much damage around for a lot of areas. Um, yeah. It comes down to funding for a lot of these you know, remedies, and um, one would hope that um, as part of the resilience um, for the future, uh, that um, there'd be some government assistance to help with some of the funding to be able to speed up some of these um, issues that you know relate to the TRI, um, Tikaraka, and everything. Because at the end of the day, ratepayers cannot afford um, huge amounts of bills filler. So one would hope that government will be here government will be here with some funds to help with the resilience program as well. So um, that's ongoing. Councillor Gregory. Thank you. Could I just ask the top, um, the dam that's at um, Murray Bay. I, I must, is it still there and is it still a risk for people downstream? So I'll, I'll jump in on that part. So we did quite a bit of work in the response to Gabrielle with the Tokamaru Bay community, understanding the risk from the Mangahuini landslide. So much to my utter disappointment, we flew up there with 100 kilos of explosives and flew home with 100 kilos of explosives. <laughs> um, so we went up there to cut a channel through. Um, however, the water had done a really good job when we'd had a fresher rain the night before and um, had naturally cut it down. We took up a whole lot of engineers, um, GNS, a whole number of engineers, can I say that? I can't remember which firms have been involved with undertaking assessments of what's left, what's rock, what's water, but the water has effectively cut down quite significantly from the photo that you can see there now. Um, it is flowing quite well and it's managed to hit Harper rock that it's hitting at the moment. There is an underlying risk from the amount of debris that is sitting up above in the landslide itself. So the landslide itself is huge. Estimates are around 400,000 cubic meters of material in that slip. 
but it's starting to dry out, but we know that it will continue to move over time and it's what that looks like. So we've got a number of independent experts that are working with um, Dr. Murray Cave and others around, well, what is the most likely scenarios going forward and what does that risk look like? Mm -hmm. At the moment, we do not think there is risk of a catastrophic failure where it would come down the valley. It is at risk of falling further, blocking water up. That's something that we're constantly monitoring to make sure that we know that it's safe for people to be underneath. There could be a landslide, um, but the people far smarter than me are figuring that out for us, and we'll come back with what that looks like with their modelings and those things. Just on that, we've got a number of independent experts across a lot of what we're talking about. And if I can just quickly cover off, when it comes to our prioritisation of flood control work, of drainage work and those things, that's a very large part of the recovery plan that the recovery office are working through for Tairawhiti. A lot of our work will include independent assessments of what we're discussing from our engineering options right through to what it's going to look like. So a lot of that will be independently peer reviewed and that will be brought through for consideration after that. All right, um, we've got um, Councillor Robinson Nick first. Thank you. The scour that happened at uh, Lebanon Road um, do you understand why that happened? And is it an inherent design issue um, that may cause us problems again? Uh, <clears throat> just to respond to that, um, it, it needs to be highlighted that um, that part um, of the Y Power Stop Bank is, uh, hasn't been upgraded, hasn't been um, yeah, um, widened or, or um, raised in that location. Um, we've, we've had an um, assessment done on that location and it's um, believed that there's, there's a, probably a two or three fold effect on the location of that. Um, you've, got, you've got high velocity um, waters on the outside of a bend. Uh, there's a gap in the vegetation at that lo location. So we've got uh, below protection in place, but um, where culvert comes out, there's a gap in, in, in that uh, willow protection. Um, so that um, allows for vortices and, and uh, vertical and horizontal um, sort of eddies to form. Um, so it's a combination of those factors. Yeah, there was also some spoil left behind as well, which may have had a contributing factor, but um, we'd never know actually, because um, there was no eyes on to, to view it and see exactly what was happening. Um, yeah. If there are any more slides to follow, is this because I just want to ask a question, but you might cover it going forward. It's about the Mangapapa stream. I'll cover. Great. Cool. Your Worship, I'll cover that when we get to stormwater. So. Awesome. Thank you. Oh, Councillor. Thank you. Chair. Um, Thanks guys for the report. It's really in depth and thank you for the images of what Mahi that's been done. Um, yeah, driving driving down the coast road now, um, just appreciating the volume of work that's happening. Um, but uh, and I understand the LIDAR aerial photos and the mapping that's being done is gonna be really helpful in informing us around our long-term plan, regional plans. Um, I understand the work that's going on now is about making sure that we can, you know, our communities can get back functioning, but always at the back of our minds is the next rain, the next rain, the next rain, and these high levels of anxiety right across the coast and in and, and, and Tikaraka and other places, as soon as the rain comes, it's like <gasps> everybody's um, anxieties go through the roof. Is there... At, at what point, you know, it's a hard question to answer. Um, will we be able to provide some degree of certainty or comfort to our communities that they no longer have to be concerned when there's a rain? Do we have an idea? <laughs> I know, so it's a really, I'm sorry, it's a hard question, but I just want to put it there. You might not have the answer, but can we have a time frame? You've got all the information now. Um, planning forward to give some comfort. 
the bees you do, you don't know. That's fine. Through the chair, it's a really difficult question to answer because at the moment we're still understanding the risks where they sit across the whole of Tairawhiti and the issues that are pertaining that are sitting there. So, for example, we haven't even touched on, and I'm surprised you didn't, Farikaheka, for example, mm -hmm. Rua Tauria, Te Arador, where we know we've got block drains, we've got gullies that are holding up for now. Um, but if you talk with Kerry Hudson and his team, you know, I can carry on and on and on. So it is one of those things that it's going to be over time, particularly for things like the Waipo flood control scheme. And I think a huge, amazing thing of having that work completed we cannot underestimate how much that saved the city side from the floodwaters that came through. On average, that was raised between a metre and a metre and a half on that side. We came up a couple of metres from Bowler. So if we hadn't done it, there would have been a metre of water coming across the Poverty Bay Flats into the back of the city. So huge acknowledgement to the past council and the team that have done the work because that kept us safer on that side. However, we've still got other work to do in other areas. So it's kind of a how long is a piece of string? I'm sorry, councillors, to be able to answer that. And it's a bit, bit of a hard, a bit of a funny question. One thing I would so say is I just wanted to add, because you raised the Parikahika, <laughs> the, the community of, Mas of Parikahika, and especially those whanau that have been stuck up at Masakawa since the end of November last year. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the um, regular communications through Kate at NoiseWorks um, weekly to the whanau and to our communities around that and the work, the sterling work that's being done by the contractors there. Um, to get through the weather and everything else um, that those families can now come down <laughs> the hill and I just wanted to pass on their thanks to to the teams and um, and yes and for the Parikahika down to the road we, you know it's also about getting housing in right so there's a lot of homes that have been waiting to be moved up the coast and homes to be built so um, and though in our 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 local network um, it's that, that comms is really important to keep people um, uh, they're giving communication is important for comfort as well. Kia ora. Well, just before we um, continue, I just want to acknowledge um, I've got a message from um, Nick uh, Councillor Tupara. Um, apology for um, not being here today, so I just want to report it, please. Thank you. Okay, we will continue. Um, I suppose the only thing I'd say, just sorry, councillor, is there also around when it comes to the rain, we understand there's anxiety out there, which is why we're trying to get drainage culverts and everything done as quickly as we can. And we'll talk to that as we go through to try and alleviate, alleviate those concerns. I would still say to the community, we are still here 24 seven. We are still going out um, when people ring through when they have concerns, but as always, please be mindful of rivers arising. Don't wait for council, don't wait for civil defence. If you think you need to move, things don't feel right, move. Um, the next report we have here, thanks, Joss. The next report we have here is actually Peter Bules um, in regards to the hub master. And I know, think he's out on the water today, actually. Um, are there any questions on the hub master action? As you can imagine, a lot of it has been around the debris in the water um, and from the maritime effect. Also, just trying to keep that communication out to um, all of the people, water users. There will be logs for a while yet as things move around. His thing very much is if you're obeying water safety rules, you're keeping to the right speed, you should be fine. Um, please take five, 10 minutes longer to get to your favorite spot. It's worth getting there than having to be rescued. Forward. Okay, for stormwater. So stormwater, and I'm gonna mix in a couple of things here if that's okay. Um, and hopefully your worship, this will cover off what you were discussing around the Mangapapa stream. Okay, got it right. So stormwater system from Cyclone Gabriel, so stormwater and wastewater, understand we were both inundated. Um, we had a number of issues that have come through from Cyclone Gabriel, and a lot of it is actually in the catchments, particularly in the city. And it was on the Monday afterwards when we had that heavy rain event that we had a lot of damage in particular in the Mangapapa area. And it was to do with the catchment there. And I've got some photos up of what's actually happened um, in that area and why it responded in some of the ways that it did. So you can see up there, this is the team went out that day and took a number of photos to try and understand what was happening within the catchments. So the picture you can see there with that log cut up, the spa pool, um, and even the car, those are things that went through our culverts. 
So they blocked the culverts completely in that heavy rain event. So not just that, but we also had um, a number of slumpages, blocks, um, those things that were there as well, as you can see that gave way that blocked the stream. But we also had things like this, where a shed washed downstream, got stuck again over a either private access way or one of our own footbridges. That's what caused a lot of the surface flooding that we had in Mangapapa and a lot of the damage that happened through that catchment. So a number of issues have happened um, over time on the Mangapapa stream catchment um, and a lot of the catchments through there where we have structures, debris, um, things well inside the flood zones for what comes through there. So that car went down under the road through the culvert. I still am amazed that it went through the culvert under the road and turned up 50 meters downstream. Oh. So when things blocked up, there were literally cars blocking culverts. So you can imagine the amount of pressure that has to go to move a vehicle or a spa pool through a 2.4 meter culvert. It's a huge amount of pressure has gone through that system and backed it up. It also will explain to you why that was such a flash event when it came up and down so fast. So it was about four or five o'clock in the morning when it really teamed down. By eight o'clock in the morning, it was gone again. And it was because a lot of the blockages had blown through. So the team have gone through with Fulton Hogan, um, our contractors, and identified a number of things that need to come out of those streams and rivers. Um, and also one of the things that we will be looking to bring back to you is around setbacks from those properties that border our council streams and rivers, because there's been, um, you know, a lot of people will treat it as their backyard and encroachments happen over time down into a flood zone. It can be tenants, properties can change hands, time people just forget that it is a flood area and it's needed to convey water when it gets a high flood event. But as you can see, sheds, pools, equipment gets planted up what we need to do is actually look at how we enforce that going forward to make sure that those are done part of it's around education and awareness raising but also around please don't put the garden shed down the bottom there so a lot of work needs to be done in that space to help be able to do it part of the issue has been around the damage because of those blockages the releases at sudden times um, we did have issues at the Lytton Road culvert um, and it did overtop. It is also designed to overtop. If you've driven from by Little West Village there, you can tell there's a little bit of a dip in the road. Um, it's supposed to be there because that becomes a secondary flow path over the top. Um, but again, a lot of it was around debris and things that were started to go through and clean out as part of our response works that we're doing. A lot of this stuff is time that we'll have to work through with properties where we've got banks that are slumped in. What does that mean? How do we prioritize that? Then there's also the question we're going to need to talk to you about soon as to who's paying for a lot of those things as well because a lot of this is private structures on private property but it has an effect on the council stormwater system that sits in behind so you can imagine there's a wider discussion as part of recovery again for the recovery manager quite like saying that um, for how it is that we're going to be bringing that um, going forward and the work that we'll be doing in that space are there any questions on stormwater or anything that i haven't touched on before we move forward that's robinson uh, first up, I um, just want to congratulate your, your staff and the construction people who worked on that Listen Road culvert. It's a really um, lovely piece of engineering. Uh, looks looks like it's fit for purpose and it's done really, really well and fast. <laughs> Second thing is, um, so that last shot you showed us was the, the back lawn aerials um, downstream from that culvert. And you talked about something on private land which is going to cause issues in our waterways eventually. So what is the sort of program there for uh, homeowners and uh, affected homeowners? Are they just being told, well, tough, that's your land, or are they been told to meet so-and-so and have an assessment and then we'll work out a plan with you? So through you, Chair, we're working through assessing where the slumping is, the impact that it's having on, and then we would like to bring a policy around that, how we're going to do that with you because the effects are, yep, it's their problem. However, for some of these things, there's either significant costs for council, for ratepayers, and or for property owners, but actually for some of them, there are different ways for us to be able to manage those catchments too. That's part of the recovery planning process, and that's where that comes through. So we're identifying in the recovery plan significant need for spending and upgrading around stormwater. That's when we'll then look at how that work gets carried out, who carries that work out, and where the funding comes from that as well. 
Your Worship. So just a, a quick question in regards to that same area, because what you just highlighted is that over time, some uses might have changed or uh, there are some activities there that could affect someone downstream's uh, uh, flooding or not flooding. So what you are saying and what I picked up from your answer to Tony is that you would treat that like a little catchment and then make sure so can, can we expect that the property owners would be part of those discussions going forward because i think um it is it's essential that they also that these buy-in from the property owners um from an early on stage through you chair what we want to do is come up with the range of options for doing this but it has to be in partnership around which options we are going to choose as part of that recovery and how that actually rolls out across because it has to be treated as a catchment approach and in stormwater it is a catchment so there's very little difference from what we need to do in our river catchments to stormwater it's just stormwater is heavily engineered and we're going to have to have some really tough conversations around well what does the operation of that look like what is the operating cost the maintenance going to look like for the level of service that people are expecting but then for some of these things it's really simple around you had a massive pile of green waste that was trees you know longer than this table down in the riverbank that was going to block there the spa pools the sheds the things that are down in that catchment you've got to bring them back out so we need to work through that with our community but also talk about what those options are with our community as part of that too Councillor Cranston thanks <clears throat> It's probably a general question about the whole thing, but under risk and uncertainty is working with the recovery. Uh, one of the highlights, of course, is funds availability for the recovery. How are we going to handle, we cannot replace life to life. We're going to have to replace to a higher standard, which is a higher cost. So how, how's that all going to pan out? <laughs> so through you, Chair, one of the things and the reason I was looking to and ether is recovery manager is around that's what the recovery plan does it sits down and it articulates this is what the problem is these are the options and for some things we will be able to be fortunate enough to build back like for like and that will be okay it will be something that was an extenuating circumstance or okay with that level of service for some things we will have to build back far better and stronger and i know dave's going to talk to some of that with um, the options that we're looking coming up in junies particularly around our bridges for example but then some things, the build back option, better and more resilient is actually going to be outside the funding realms that we will have available to us. And that's part of those discussions that need to happen through the recovery planning process. They need to happen with our community to be able to prioritise things. And then also working with, once we've got those with central government and other funders, what can be funded and what can't be, and then what are the options if it's not and being worked through. So the recovery plan is the document that goes into that in a lot more detail and it sets out the time frames and parameters for getting to hence the option will be this one going forward a threat chair i suppose yes. as an example um we've got a number of bridges that are out and there are different solutions involved in terms of whether you replace like for like you build back better or you um, install a Ford, for example. So those are all the sorts of types of things that will be covered through the uh, recovery plan. Right, okay, thank you. Councillor Telfer. Yeah, Dave, just um, on the stormwater side of it, and um, this is sort of a drainage um, question, really. Um, you mentioned um, drains um, out part of Thai, front of road, working down through. But I think there's just a um, one of the biggest um, lot of complaints that, as a councillor, um, we seem to receive is, is around drainage um, of council drains, and which is then impacting on different people's properties. And this is right through Pilma Road as one, for instance. It seems to be a real bottleneck. Um, I, I just, yeah, I, I just want to understand that this is not so much a cyclone Gabriel or anything, this is a business as usual, this has been going on for quite a long time, is around um, if we can get a real communication to the community about what is the plan and what's, you know, what's the, is there a regular cleaning of some of these drains? So I think if the communications to them is that this is going to happen um, and, and it's, on a, it's on a plan, I think that will really help a lot. But, um, a sort of, you know, a lot of the some of the answers that they've been getting back from council have been a little bit, um, I suppose, not not that adequate. So I just yeah. 
Through you, Chair, when it comes to drains, which are council, which are private property, which are things that we cover, there is far more drains in this district that we do not look after and we don't have a level of service for. So when we talk about, and if, whether it's stormwater drains, our drainage districts, or even our roading ones, there are a number of things that we don't cover and aren't included in our level of service when it comes to drains. Part of the opportunity that comes out of the recovery plan is to look at our levels of service. And to be frank, we can't afford to maintain quite a large number of drains that we have now, as the committee is already aware. But it is also around working through with landowners where their drain comes into a council drain. We don't go into the private property unless it's something that's identified as a drain that we maintain. And there's very few of them across the district compared to how many drains there are. Even with roading, there are policy issues around people's private culverts in our drains or in some of our drainage districts that we don't maintain because of the way that that is set up. That's part of the opportunity around what are our levels of service going forward. Given an event like this, you see what happens when some's working well, some's not working well, part of the recovery plan. Even if we blew through the district today and cleaned all the drains, they'll be fine until the next event and then we'd have to go back through and do it again. So it's what's an actual level of service that we can afford as a community, but take your point, Councillor Telfer, around communicating which drains we are doing, which range drains we're not doing, and I'll let Dave talk to some of the roading priorities around the drains that they've got at the moment, um, and as part of that. Next. Attorneys. So just quickly while Dave's getting here, because I'm speaking for Libby, um, who's not here at the moment on the BAU. So what we thought we'd do is we'd just chuck up behind you around where we're sitting on the network around what's impacted and what's not across the district. So the blue, the darker blue is your, we're back to BAU, things are working. And the reason why I wanted to highlight this before Dave speaks is because with the network the way that it is, we our BAU is very much set around productivity and it's set around the delivery. So if you think of a grader, for example, it has a set grading program that it goes through this road down, this road down, this road down, this road. We can't follow our normal routes because the impact across the district so much at the moment. So when you look at it, if I could take Hikudangi, for example, 23% of that network is at what we would call BAU status, where we could be back to doing normal maintenance and those kind of things. Another 35% can be done, but actually it's got slips or dropouts or there are issues across those roads as well. 13% of it is actually closed. And then another 13 is flood damage. And then we've got our 16% there, which is flood damage and it's accessible by four by four only. Those are the roads where we've managed to cut a track through, but we haven't been able to go back through and get that back up to a BAU level of service that we would expect. Um, as you can see, the Tūranga contract, which is the city, they're pretty much back to BAU with just a few things that they need to do um, to tidy that one up. So that one would be the least expected. Um, as we go through as part of that, but it gives you kind of an idea of the damage that we have across the whole district. It's still quite large out there and that is affecting our, our maintenance contracts, but also gives you an idea of where the damage is. And a lot of it is, as you would expect, Hikarangi, Uawa and Waipawa in particular, big areas, they've had some, some pretty big impact across those and we're working through what that looks like. I'll hand over to you, Dave. Yeah, yeah, got it. This um, slide, um, everyone knows about the bridges, is we've just asked WSB just to give a, a visual. It's just a catchment study of, of what's happened on some of the bridges and, we'll, we'll buy it, and we're still going through the, the decisions of, of, of how it failed and why it failed and why some, some, some didn't. So there's, there's some discussions there. There's issues about slash and there was also discussions about where was the bridge just so strong we didn't, didn't actually, historically, some engineers, they actually put weak points on the on the on the edges of the bridges, so that would fail. And so you, 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 that part would fail, and so the water would go past, and that would allow, all you had to do was just put some rocks there and you'd have some, you'd, you'd have some um, bridge back. So there's, there's a lot of thoughts. We're still working, you know, obviously, when the des engineers designed the way back in the, in the um, early 40s, 50s, they just looked at water and silt. They didn't look at potentially as council slash and what that would do onto that. They never thought about it. And it's, there's no fault, it's just something we do. So we're working through there. 
there are still people, as, as Dave has mentioned, that we're, they're stuck and they're still using dinghies. We've been able to, the team have worked hard to be able to get a um, bushy knoll. We're still waiting for a, um, a Bailey Bridge to come, but we, we the, that community of about 20 people, we just had to get come up with an option. So we, we cobbled up some secondhand pieces of bridges and, and got something through. So, and we can show you that. And I'll, 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 oh, sorry. Okay, um, that just shows that, you know, obviously you've seen the photos. The, the one which, which probably um, you haven't is, is the one of the ute, and that's the amount of slash, oh, sorry, silt that we've got to remove. And so we've estimated, and it's just an estimate, about 650,000 cubes that we've got to remove. And that's just not culverts, that's just um, our roadside drains, and that's across the whole area. And we'll have a discussion about that later on because um, we've been able to get permission from landowners, but there's still some, um, um, you know, before you'd allow me to put 30,000 tonnes of uh, cubes of material, you, you want some documents of some and some promises. So we've got templates, we're working through those. We, we've actually got about 45 sites with um, 45 sites that are ready to go, but they've still got to be established. And um, any teams that we take off that establishment means we're taking them off other projects. So we've got to work through that. It's, a, it's not an um, easy job, it's a messy job. It just takes time. We're competing with, um, we've got culverts to clean, but we're competing with also with uh, Josh's teams and the stormwater teams for the specialised equipment that actually you have to flush through those culverts. And so we're, we're working through that. It's not like the, you can get that type of equipment um, every across Central Hawke's Bay. They're all after that, that specialised thing. So we, where we can, we're trying to clean it, but some of it, you just need to go out there and flush it. Okay, they're just pictures uh, you've probably seen. Okay. It's a good one. People actually read it and they stopped and stopped. So that was on Riverside Road. Um, they, that was put up by the residents. Yeah. Just with the, that bottom uh, to my screen, the left hand, what we've had to do is you see the, the concrete crib wall, you know, that's, that's um, um, basically starting to move away. That's yeah. So what we had to do, you see these plates that we put. Well, that's just been able to put access on. But instead of getting designs, what we decided is we're just ripping that out and just putting rock there. It's easier to start from scratch than trying to rebuild those parts. We and that's just to get people access through. That's to get freight. Right. But in some areas, we have um, we've opening up access. Uh, the top bit that. Uh, Show again. We've got a lot of exposed banks, okay? And so we are looking at a hydro seeding program. So what we're concerned about is if we go into winter, these we don't get some grass or something on there, that's just gonna cause ongoing problems for us. Okay, Tinaroto Bluffs, that there. Um, look, we really do need to, uh, big shout out to our, our um, contracts for that, to getting that access road, you know, Parakanapa Road, it's not a, it was never designed for as an alternative. It's not flash. And it was so, and the, you know, those residents, they, um, there was a lot of hard grind for them to that. And, you know, they're, they're just knowledgeable with that. So that's actually open. It's actually on lights now, 15 minutes. You know, we're getting calls from um, uh, movers. Can they start moving houses through that section of the, of the bluff? So, you know, it's, it's to, to go to Wairau, there's, so there's, there's a lot of um, issues that we've sort of sort out. We've said them go up there and have a look because it's more the width now, it's down to one single lane. But those are some of the discussions. All right, uh, yeah, before and after that, just so some of the scale. Um, we've been working off, um, and I'll talk about before, we've got other projects. Um, we're having discussions with Waku Tahi. Our funding rules only allow us to clean um, 40 to 50 metres each side of the bridge. We're going back to them to say that there's, there's still ongoing problems up the catchment and right for wrongly, they're going to end up on our bridges. So we need to deal with that, that situation. So the, um, I've come back and said our policy says, but so we, we're still having those discussions with them. We think you, we can't ignore it. So at the moment, we haven't been able to get rid of all the slash. We've actually got to find a home for it. Uh, a lot of landowners, previously would have uh, were okay for us to actually just to place it on their properties and bear it. Now they're saying, no, we, we actually don't want it anymore. It's taking up valuable land. They'll take the silt. 
So at this stage, they'll, they'll put up there. Um, the residents said, yeah, look, um, some of that we'll use for firewood, that's cool. But other than that, they just don't want wood, giant trees on their, uh, to be buried on their properties. So that's something we've got to, um, that's why you may see stockpiles further up. We're trying to put them out of floodplains. Okay, um, across the district, you'll see, yeah, there's, there's silt, then there's a lot of piles and a lot of um, material to move. Right at the top end, you'll see um, Paparatu Road. It, it's, it's, um, it's, it's, we're doing a little bit of trialing and a little bit of pushback with some of our funding policy people. We've put rock up there. We've actually fixed that, that bridge. We are arguing that if we kept, technically what you need to do is, is put it in a semi called stable state, put up traffic management, I don't need to explain. We're coming back and saying the cost to do that, and since we've got all the equipment, uh, there is a cost, no doubt, but we say the ongoing cost. And so we've got a few trolls, and the other one was uh, Lytton Road um, culvert as well. Um, we've, we've put betterment in some of these areas. Technically, they are probably pushing over the other side of the funding rules, but that's something we're going to argue quite strongly with Wakate. Okay. Not all of them, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, um, look, there is, because we've got such a big rural network, a lot of um, people probably don't see the, there is work being done, okay? It's just, and Dave and I were talking about um, how he's trying to look at some strategic comms because people, look, we're, the, the problem is a lot of the, the team are actually deep down trying to fix things and we've, we're forgetting about the community. So that's something that we're, this is another area that uh, Whare Ponga wrote. Look, um, technically again, we shouldn't have been doing those repairs, but they were basically up in Ruatoria. No, this is something we're willing to argue, aren't we? Yeah. yeah. So look, they were up in Ruatoria. It was all there, the dolos. We fixed it. Once again, the cost to do that, to put traffic management, to leave the site, to put it at risk during winter. Okay. Now, well, look, we're not doing it for everything. We know that, um, and I don't want to send a signal to the government that the moment we put a bit of local share in, oh, Yes, then it's basically um, that's that's the benchmark, and we said we're not. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but like <laughs> two, two days. So yeah. you say they were only because that was based in, but that road is so close to rural Toria, it's not assured. So the cost, yeah, okay, the, we'd already purchased the dollars. The cost isn't high if it comes back things. So we're not going out there and spending multi-million dollars on outside the funding envelopes. Okay. Yeah, I mean. I know it doesn't sound exciting, but it's the BAU that's starting, that's happening. Okay. Um, the wharfs, as the moment, yeah, it's, it is closed. Um, we're still trying to, we've taken away some of our uh, professional service providers to look at some of our other bridges. So that's why there's the delay. It's been, it, it was put up there because we had concerns about the bridge, but, and people jumping off it. We've also still got the gates on the railway bridge. We haven't taken off. I mean, we'll, we'll get round to it, but once again, we said it's just, we probably, maybe some of our signage needs to be a bit strengthened. Okay, um, this one more just gives an example of what's, what's happening in some of our bridges. Okay, this was up uh, East Cape. Okay, first of all, we've gone and said, oh, there's a fault. Can I just point out the fault just to make sure yeah. we know what it is? Yeah. So see this crack here? On the, it's mm -hmm. running up through there? That bridge abutment had moved. So that crack had about that much before it was going to fall off. We all stood on a bridge when like a heavy truck goes over it and now it sways a bit. The danger we had was that that beam wasn't going to be connected to mm -hmm. that because it had been hit and had moved in that event from the debris and stuff coming up against it. So the concern for us for Fano was what well, it all looks fine to us, but if you stood there and looked at it and looked down, nothing was lining up where it was supposed to be. And we were down to millimeters from where the load bearing beam was supposed to be sitting on an apartment. It was not. So, sorry, don't no, no, that's right. So we still had um, the community that were trapped. They still had produce they wanted to, to um, move. And so we had to do an alternative. We put the alternative up and now we've, we've got to start looking at what the, um, our next, uh, the repair is. And just to come back, sometimes we're in such a rush to repair it that we're not actually taking into consideration, um, well, how do we stop that from happening again? So, but... And that's see where you'll probably, I'm talking to the team, sometimes you need to pause and just think. I know we're trying to rush things, get them fixed, but where's the opportunities for betterment? So we're not, okay. So 
That's all for the reward. Thank you, Chair. Just while we're on our TD, I yes. thank you for that. Um, but I just wanted to note that a few months previously, I had put in a, a request to have the debris move, removed from around the pot, those poles, because the community had noted that it was going, this was going to happen. And I think it just raises the point around community local knowledge and that at the time they had a solution to remove that. What was sent in and said was a team of arborists who trimmed around the sides and the trees were not removed. And then consequently the next with Gabrielle, more came down. So, and then we had the situation where else, uh, the school children from East Cape had to be walked across the bridge every day, every morning. We had the everything stopping on basically on that side of the river and everybody having to walk across to, to Te Araroa. Um, so whilst there's a lot of work going on, there's also been a couple of youths that have ended up in the drink uh, of going through the river, because you could only go through the river course um, on a low tide, obviously, um, to get to Te Araroa. So I just want to raise that because whilst there's a lot of work being done and you're now thinking about what, how to mitigate any future effects on that bridge, that we listen to what the communities are saying around the things that are happening and coming. Uh, they can see it, they have a plan to remove it. In this case, we had qualified, well-experienced um, machine operators with machines to offer to remove some of the debris, to take the pressure off um, council and, and our teams to do the mahi. Um, and this could have been avoided, is what I'm saying. So if I just can, Councillor, part of the issue we have is, as Dave's alluded to, around the funding for what we can and can't do. And it's one of the things with Waka Potahi as to how far back we can remove things, the preemptive maintenance. You be aware, for example, hazardous trees, we can't remove them until they get to the white line under the policy. We don't get funding for that. So a lot of this, we actually need a change in our funding and with NZTA around in our regional land transport plan and in our funding under the National Land Transport Fund, we actually need an ability to do preemptive maintenance for these things before they hit. We're frustrated at the moment where you can see large debris upstream on a number of rivers that are sitting there <coughs> waiting to come down and we can't go and get it because we have no funding for it. Council has no ability to pay for it from ratepayers because Pauline would kill me. Mm -hmm. But the issue we have is that we can see it sitting there but we can't fund it and we can't task our people to go on and do it because of the way that, that policy is currently set up. Very frustrated. So um, for our recovery phase, um, we've, we've basically got uh, five projects, five major projects. And, and well, one is silt, silt and, and um, removal. So we, we're putting costings around there. The other one we'll be doing is a woody debris um, study. And that's, and we know um, that's not being funded by Wapotei, the things, but we've got to let them know that, what the scale of the problem is. There will be a um, Tenaro Bluffs, we're going to have to um, work through that. Okay. And um, the cost, yeah, one of the things, uh, the next one you'll see dropout repairs. One of the things we've, uh, we still are in that discovery phase. There's still a lot of dropouts that we actually have to try and get people around to just do, is it just as some scaling? So some of that, sometimes some of our figures that we'll probably give Dave, you might hear some different, different um, numbers, it's just that we're still having to provide him, the more we start getting around the network to finally open it up, um, then we can uh, nail down the numbers. The last one is with the bridge repairs, and I'd just like to take up that, um, there was the talk about some of the crossings. Some of the crossings, access crossings we've put in, they will not last during the winter, and so they won't. But at least we can show to the government we've tried, they haven't worked. Okay, we need to start, and so, because that's the first thing they'll ask, can you get a board across? Okay, so um, people might, so yeah, you're right. And we're not, we won't argue that. So those are just the phase that we're gonna move up when we have our discussions with, with central government. And sorry, and some of these bridges there, there we will we'll be competing with national resources and, and our designers, but we're, we're getting very close to yeah. coming up with some options. Hey Dave, I've got a question. Um, what percentage of bridges were taken out and or majorly damaged from slash? 
what was the percentage? So I'm not going to let Dave answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> There's a number of investigations and things that will come through that will talk about what's been affected by different things. And we know, for example, one bridge in particular that was not slash that took it out we know exactly what it was and i'll talk about that in public excluded but it was a private property thing that's happened there so that component of it will come in future reports that will come from the enforcement team not from from our team around those sort of things cool sorry Dave. No, no, that's just the the, the last um, slide i've got here is oh, the council sorry Tibble, uh, i've got a question sorry council council. Tibble. Tima Kura, gentlemen. Um, <clears throat> I want to just uh, take a quick little skip back to where Annie left off Hi. and um, talk about the limitations of policy, which then means we can't act. And then also the space of lived experience modeling within the community and the agency that they might have to need to act. When these two are competing interests, but they actually want to achieve the same thing, how does that marry? Because in all the spaces that I've been up the coast talking, that's what has been the majority problem, the limitations of council's policy to act. Um, and so it becomes counterproductive in some cases to the action. Uh, but then there's the other part, as I said again, lived experience modeling of those people who actually live in that space around that problem. Um, and this tension is a natural tension, of course, but it seems to be, and where I'm hearing, people talk a lot about not being able to act, and that's not acting on both sides, which then creates a stalemate of no action or disaction. Um, mm. Do you get what I'm talking about? Mm. And the question is, what is the solution to these both stalemate, um, counter um, productive aspects because we're essentially paralyzed to move. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so through you, Chair, I think there are a number of issues that come through and we have our funding policies, we have our mandates that we have from you as staff will be able to do things. And remember those are set through your levels of service and your long-term plan. In our long-term plan, we have our budgets that are set. We also have the levels of service that we're able to do as well. For a number of these things, the issues come down to whether it's a private property issue or a council issue. And some, they're intertwined, absolutely, you should say council at all. The issue that we have going forward, and I know you hate me saying it all the time, but it is around budget and funding. We do not have the funding to intervene on the number of issues that we know we have across the district. We're going with our funding that we're putting forward for recovery, for example, is in the hundreds of millions of dollars just to be able to build back to where we were when we were already having a network that was fragile. The issue comes when if we can take either the Awatiri or the Karakatu Fiddle, either of those. We know there are assets of ours that are at risk because there are things further upstream and pretty much all of our bridges, there are things in there that would could be potential issues for us. We have to prioritize where we can intervene and where we can't. Other issues are around public. Um, roads versus private land ownership, what we're doing on those things. So it's quite a complex thing site by site as to what it is, but then actually having the budget available, but then the policy that enables us to be able to intervene and do things is really hard because of where it is, what it is, how all of those things, it's a really difficult thing for us to be able to do. It's similar to a number of the issues on the water supply pipeline. There are still things that are keeping us up at night there, but it's around prioritizing what we can actually afford to do. And then are we even able to do some of those things because they're on private land? But that's our long-term plan discussion around how far you want us to go on that level of service and what the funding for that looks like and how we prioritize it. And in our recovery plan about what funding we have available and how do we partner, particularly with our landowners with our mana whenua as to well, actually what are the best solutions for you? Places like Ruatoria, for example, College Creek, we have to look at some of the land use above, we have to look at digging it out, all of those things. Actually, it's going to be the people there that will help us around what's making significant interventions and in those things there. Yeah, just a quick question about the um Oh, when we went on our on our hikoi before the cyclone and you had said then Mr. Wilson about the lack of places to uh, for site silt to stumping mm -hmm. um, and driving down the coast road, I 
there's, you know, there's obviously a big problem as well. What constitutes a salt dump site space? Um, we have a template that we've, we've um, agreed with our regional team, and basically it just shows the, the volume, and but also, um, and we, we actually give that to the landowner, and it shows where we what we intend to do to practice. There's enabling works and there's aftercare, so to use it, you know, we're probably going to have to put fencing up and things like, like that. So it's just not see you later. So that's what because they're on private land, that's what they want to see. Oh, you know, I was just interested in this how to how you work through that with. Um, given the volume yeah. of um, debris that needs to be moved and silt that needs to be fed. We have some that are coming up. We're trying to find new ones and we're always interested in talking to people about who has land that they would like to see a gully filled or if there's ways we have to get a consent, we'll put the access roads in, we'll put the fences in if needed to be able to do that um, because there's a huge benefit to us as well. So absolutely always looking to partner. A lot of the stuff you see on the side of the roads, um, that, Unfortunately, we'll have to get double handled sometimes. Mm. So we'll clear a slip and we have to move it away once it's dry enough to be able to move. But normally that's where we're trying to put it into places. But it's also working with landowners, as Dave said, what are they going to accept? It sounds okay, but then you find out you've got, say, 100 trucks a day driving over your whenua to then dump stuff in. You've got bulldozers, you've got interruption. You want us to put a driveway in, you want us mm. to clean it up when we go. It's it's not as simple as just filling in a gully. Even though we're mm. So we're happy to work with landowners, make it as easy as possible when we can, but um, it, it does take time. Yes, and sorry, we have to make it quite clear to landowners that you can't put a building or a housing on that. So that's because, I mean, they might look at our future, oh, can I put a shed, a shed or a house? And we basically say, look, this, you can have issues later on. Okay. Um, Councillor Gregory. Um, yeah, sorry, sorry. Just want, um, just going back to that BAU slide that you had. Um, so in town, ninety percent of BAU is back. Does that mean that you are going, you're back doing the things that you said you were going to do in this, in this financial year, or is that affected also by the, um, by this, these events? That's a great question. So part of what we're working through at the moment is what BAU we're going to carry on doing. That's reflective that network is back up. However, as this slide is going to show, and as we all know, driving around, there's a whole number of potholes that have mm -hmm. popped up, all of that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. We're working really hard to prioritise our crews across the district and across all of our contractors as to where we need them best. And that's why people will see what well, won't see people turning up to do like Fulton Hogan, we've just agreed them they've done enough of their works they needed to do from flood recovery, they're allowed to go back to some of the capital works that they had sitting there. But it really is around trying to make sure we get as much fixed as possible before we go back to the BAU. So you might see some levels of service, but we want to change, but we're going to bring that back to you before we do it. But that's part of the recovery plan for roading with the available resource, the weather conditions and prioritisation. How do we make that work across the whole of the district? Um, yes, just the final slide I've got is um, we actually had 80% um, of the reseal program, that's the chips, and so we've had to divert some of that, and you'll see a lot of work going on the Poly Bay Flats. That was actually um, in year's, next year's program, but we couldn't physically get to some of the other sites. So we've got chip that's stored, and we, we've got to use it because it's... Um, because what you do is it actually starts getting contaminated with dust, and the moment you start, if, if you leave that over a period, that's what starts if you see it's flying off. So that's why people say, oh, why is this road getting down Pilmers? And it's just that there were other sites on Tinaroto we physically couldn't get to. So that's why, so that's some work we're doing. And the final one is um, our normal budget for heavy metalling. So that is getting diverted to um, bypasses now. Okay, so there, but I road, there's a lot of roads and, and um, areas where we, we know that during the winter, potentially the state highway could close or else some other Tinaroho could close. So that's where we're trying to bulletproof some of them. Just because I can see Pauline's face, we've been paid for that yes. though. So <laughs> we've moved the material, not the money, all right, Pauline? Yeah. And, and um, just just a final thing, um, there was just acknowledged, you know, with some of the strategic stuff, well, one of the successes we've had over Gabriel so far is that we've actually had no one dead or serious injured from our contractors. And those are those processes that they've put in. You know, we have she qualified, they're there from the council, put them there for a reason. They've got their processes. There's a lot of work put through. So that's been a really good thing. And I've mentioned Dave also as well, was um, 
actually his hub is going to be pretty um pretty experienced hub after this we've got a lot of young engineers who rightly or wrongly as we've said to them, take this as an opportunity that you'll never get opportunities like this to look at bridges so the district will be well set up in okay. the future for they'll probably get a rain event go ho hum you know it's going to be <laughs> like that even though we don't want it but they'll get everything from water storm water rivers control land drainage to roading very quickly um, the next section in your report is not solid waste it's actually the building team are there any questions on roading before we move off i think it's a pretty comprehensive one thanks dave oh, yes, sorry sorry through the chair just about photo road um is who belong who, who, who owns the road is it a i don't is it a what was it a what was road is it a local network road what's please so for Poto Road, we have taken that on as a local road and are 100% funded by Waka Kotahi for the construction and maintenance of that road. We're delivering it on their behalf because they don't have the contractors who could do it, but we do. So we have an existing contract with Kudu Contracting. So during the response, we were able to do it quickly because we already have a partnership with Kudu Contracting and have for a number of years. So we worked with Ricky's team to develop that up really fast and put that through what he couldn't move as quickly as we did so we did it for them um, on the proviso that it will be there and we're working through with them now how long it needs to be so even though they've got their bailey bridge coming in it can only take 50 ton max the trucks that come down 35 are 54 ton they can't go over the bailey bridge and you need the extra four ton of logs if you're making things viable coming down the coast but also for things like transporters that are taking stuff through, so the big heavy equipment that forestry use, they won't be able to use that Bailey Bridge, they'll be oversized. So that's why we've done that piece of work with um, NZTA. Supplementary, thank you for that clarification. Um, also, in regards to houses that are also waiting to be moved up the coast, which would the Bailey Bridge, no, they won't sustain that, they'd use the other road, right? So through you, Chair, we've discussed this with NZTA around which is best. We built Poto Road for it to be able to take more of the large, heavy, oversized equipment. It is wide enough to take houses through. Um, it meets the standards. Um, I think it's about a metre extra wider when we, construction, when we constructed it to make sure that you can take those things through. So Poto Road is accessible. The thing with it with maintenance, it's a very green road. So for, for people, it will continue to move because we've literally cut a track through and now we will stabilize and get it to be able to hold so it does need a lot of maintenance um, but it is the route to get through um, and we'll maintain that um, with kudu contracting going forward well, just one more in regards to photo because i've driven around it a couple of times now and just the the fuddy the home that's there at the as you come in, into it and out of it I just feel for them because they must be getting a hell of a lot of dust. Is there a way that we can mitigate that for them? So through the chair, we're working through that at the moment. Um, we have a plan for that and we've been talking to the residents about what we're going to do, particularly timeframes. We've got to remember the replacement bridge is two to three years away before we get a proper bridge in through there. So that was part of the consideration with the landowners um, that, and the residents that are there. Also for the farming operation around the fences that will have to be put in and done. It's a two to three year thing. It's, it's not going to be done in six months, which is why it's had the level of investment to hold it for that level of time as well. Um, so building consents, apologies, Ian Petty's not here. So the building consents team is slammed at the moment, um, as you can imagine, with the number of houses, the inspections, everything they're doing here, but happy to talk through the report that he sent through there. Um, so a huge amount of work going on across Tairawhiti when it comes to helping homes recover um, and working through the temporary accommodation that has gone in from a number of suppliers, but also working through with homeowners around what does water damage mean? What does your red yellow sticker mean? How do we work through that with people? Um, and then also working out flood level heights, what that means for reinstatement and all of that kind of thing. So a lot of work going on in that space. Happy to take questions. Councillor Robinson. Oh, sorry, uh, Councillor Robinson. Page 25, um, it talks about 521 properties checked 
25 red placard, 201. Assessments are ongoing as the region becomes more accessible. Um, just for our community's uh, peace of mind, what sort of timeframes are we really realistically looking at just completing those assessments? I know they're going hardcore. I know they're under the pump, um, but having a number in people's minds is, is, is of massive value. So through the chair, those are the properties that we've been in and checked where we know that there were issues. When we've checked them, they've either been given the green, everything's fine, you're able safe to move back in. There are some where we've identified there were additional land movements. So we do have a number of properties where we're working with those residents around either our that have moved or where there are cracks or slips that might be on those properties. So we're monitoring those with the residents if things change. When it comes to a red or yellow stickered house, we have to work directly with the property owners or their representatives about what is the process for them to move back in. So for example, a number of those 200 yellow stickered houses, it is either silt that is underneath them, which means they're not safe to go back in, or they haven't dried out yet. So we have moisture testers that we've got going out. We've also supplied some of those as well for people to be able to have a look, see if the wood has dried out in order to be able to put the jib back on to be able to make the house habitable. A number of them also have silt that is up to the floor level and it's around the removal of that. So a lot of that time frame depends on the homeowner and their insurance companies or whoever it is that they're partnering with to get those houses redone. So unfortunately, I can't say they will all be ready by this stage because a lot of it matters on how fast that house is drying out, what their plan is, what their insurance company plan is, all of those things as we work through. Dave, do we have enough temporary accommodation to house the displaced families? So we haven't been looking after the temporary accommodation that's been sitting with MSD. We understand that Fano are either staying with relatives or they have been placed in temporary accommodation. We're working hard with temporary accommodation providers to bring, um, and you would have seen some of those in the paper, Tuitu Tairafiri and others around putting um, dwellings for people to move back onto their homes while they're waiting through um, the insurance process or working with what they're gonna do going forward. Okay. The next one's actually water supply. Um, so water supply, the only thing I'd like to highlight there from the report, because I think we've talked about water supply enough, um, is there's two things. One is the ongoing works. As I said earlier, we're still in response for water, and that is partly to do with the discoloration in the lakes and how bad the lakes are at the moment. So our two main lakes, Clapcott and Williams, we have a issue with the sedimentation that is in there, they're not cleaning up. Our third smaller lake is the Sang Dam, which feeds into the Clapcott Dam. We're looking and have started works to put a direct pipeline in from the Sang Dam down to the main dam line that runs um, back down to the Tiaro plant. The reason for that is because where we take water from the Wanaki River, it is fine now, but once we get into winter, that water will start to get dirty again. So the plan is, is to put a separate pipeline in from Sang down to our main dam and we will take it from there as an ongoing measure for resilience, but also while we wait to see what happens with the landslides that have happened um, across the Wanaki Dam catchment. The other part of that is around with the dams as dirty as they are, we have and are sourcing at the moment an additional treatment option to be able to help up there around how we can treat the water coming out of the dams because this will be an ongoing issue for us. So we are looking to add clarifiers to that dam treatment um, as part of this, as part of our insurance and as part of our recovery response as well. The last bit just to highlight before I put the questions is there's been some discussion around the bore that we attempted to do during the response um, with Leaderbrand. So they had a groundwater bore that we've sunk some money into with them. So the intention was during the response was how feasible was it to take water out of the bore that is on the leader brand property at the top of Nelson Road. The water is there. The bit that we were trying to do was to use some plant that we had available at the time to see how fast we could take water out of that bore to start injecting it back into the city supply. So near, while we were doing that, we had a whole lot of things running in parallel. While we were doing it, the water quality was going to take, it was too high in ammonia, and we were going to have to treat it really heavily. And the treatment cost to bolt onto the plant that we had in region, it wasn't worth doing, and we had other sources come online faster, so we jumped and went to those instead. 
the UV that we purchased was actually used straight away um, to treat some of the non-potable water that was going into the food production here in town. So we have used it, nothing's been lost. All the equipment is still there and we are still working through the feasibility of that bore using the right kit and equipment as part of the recovery going forward. So we have got ongoing things with that. The sunk costs that we had there are not sunk because we will still be able to use that in the future once we have the right plant and equipment to be able to do that. So long story short, the plant we had wasn't going to be suitable, so we jumped and we moved it onto somewhere else. We will bring back something around a future use for that bore going forward as well. So any questions on water supply? Councillor Robinson. Thanks. Um, you've touched on it a little bit, Mr. Wilson, but um, page 27, you've talked about the dam's water quality will, will remain variable as the slips continue to discharge more silt. So, so several things. How big is the sand dam? What's its capacity? So through you, Chair, if we were to take out of the sand dam, we would get about 38 days straight of full water supply from the sand dam. It's hard to say that it's 38 days because we would obviously be supplementing from white power and we would have rain at this time of year for that as well. So it does top up naturally, but if you take what's there, you've got 38 days of full production capacity that would be taken out. However, we would never take full capacity and we would expect it to recharge as we were drawing down because it does recharge through that catchment as it comes through. Yep, um, and would there not be a risk that if you emptied it out, it being an earth dam, you're going to have facilitation issues again, or is this bottom pretty well lined out naturally by now? So that 38 days is for the usable water within the dam. We would never drain it to 100%. Yeah. So then the comment I'm, I'm interested in is that uh, the slips that will keep discharging into the two other big dams, um, and, and it, when it rains, there'll be more slippage, and you'll wait until the slips regenerate and provide plant cover. Uh, we actively got a program in place to in fact regenerate and plant that those sort of faces instead of waiting for airborne seeds to get there in five years time are we actually actually going to go and plant those sort of faces up so through the through your chair the team have been looking at our options for how we hold those up and what are the interim measures that we're able to do so identifying plant species that will establish quickly um, particularly on the wetlands that sit below those slips to help absorb silt but then can we do aerial spraying to be able to try our seeds into there and plants into there to try and slow it up. We're also looking at what mechanisms we can bring in as filter material to be able to help speed that process up. It's about 40,000 square metres of material has moved within those catchments um, is what we can see the landslides across it. We don't know the cubic volume, but it's about that much area has moved in that bush catchment that's come down at the moment. So we are looking and the team are going up to do assessments for the experts to see how we can try and hold it up sooner rather than later. And the last question I didn't see in the report or in this section, what is the anticipated time frame that the two other dams, NTUs, was it NTU or BT, or NTU will get down to a 20 NTU. What's the, they just naturally let them settle a year, two years. So through your chair, one of the issues that we've got is that with, there's no precedence for this for Wanaki. There are other options that we've discounted quite quickly because of the risks involved. At the moment, we think it could be upwards of six months, if not more, for it to come down. Hence why the team are looking at the clarifiers going in, so putting lamella clarifiers in before the drinking water, because we think we will be able to do that faster, but also for longevity and for resilience going forward, it would mean that we could take dirtier water out of the dam, so we wouldn't need the NTUs to come down, but also it would mean we could take out of the Tiarai and the Wainaki River even when we normally couldn't at the moment, because we'll be able to clean it as it comes through. So from resilience, that's what we're going through. And Pauline's just reminded me to remember to say a lot of this is covered by insurance. So we have insurance for what we're doing here, and that's part of the breakdown of that funding that we'll be talking through. And you'd have to imagine it'd be cheaper than why power sourced treated water because of the amount of treatment that has to go through, that, that water has to go through. We'll get back to you on the operational cost, depending on the plant that we choose to do. So the team were in Tauranga yesterday, investigating that with Filtech around which lamella clarifier we would use. So they all have pros and cons, and then they'll be making a recommendation. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Councillor Cranston. Councillor Alder. Thank you, Chair. Um, the use of flocculants 
in sections of the dam, obviously not alum, but has that been looked at as a possibility of dropping the sediment? So through you, Chair, yes, we have. Um, part of the concern we have, and the uh, for the wider committee, sorry, there's a number of treatments you can do for clarifying the water um, from aerial spraying of gypsum into the dam, which tracks it, or other flocculants that will pull the debris down and make it settle. The issue that we have, there's no one internationally who's done it on a scale that we're talking about. Um, and the issue that you have with large water bodies is when you do it, it can actually cause the water to rotate. So as the sediment comes down, it pulls a current, which brings it all back up again. So the issue you have is that as that material starts to fall down or as you start to get it, you get a change in the water current and it will stir it all back up again. Our concern is we don't want to be the ones to try it um, on a large scale for a drinking water supply for town and there's costs involved and also adding chemicals to that larger area. Um, we, we're not, we don't think it's worth the risk um, to be able to do that. Councillor Tolkien. You know, can you just give us um, a little bit of clarification around the, the WIPO intake? Um, about there's been quite a lot of reports, you know, that how dirty the water is, you know. Um, is that water taken out of the gravels, like that right down under the river or not? Because um, I was wondering about the possibility of like, um, I know there's quite a few intakes that are, are right down in the gravels underneath, so you're not, you're getting them, yeah, you clean the water. It's, What's the setup for that one, just for clarity? Yeah, so through the chair, we have an infiltration chamber, we call it, where you've got the pipes buried slightly below the gravel, uh, but sorry, below the gravel, um, that we suck in through. The problem you have is when we're pulling through the volume of water that we were during Gabriel, it's very, very high sediment load. It clogged the screens quite quickly. So what we were trying to pull through was clogging up all of the infiltration gallery just by the sheer volume and the silt that was in there. We had the Navy divers go in and clean it at one stage when it dropped. Um, but essentially you're trying to take flood water and turn it into drinking water at high volume and high capacity. So at 580 cube an hour for what those guys were pulling through was unbelievable when you stood on the river and then saw what it was coming out the other end. It's literally just everything was getting clogged coming in. So we couldn't draw it in as fast as we could treat it at one stage. That's when we went to chucking pumps straight in and pumping raw water straight from. And that's also when we put the temporary pipe from the Paratahi line um, and the Paratahi private scheme. And we took out of there, they allowed us to go in and take it from their infiltration gallery as well. So it was simply the water has just got so much silt um, in it and the fine particulate, it's blocking the screens as they come through. As the water cleaned up, we could turn the pumps back up to full volume and full noise. What had happened if we'd taken it from that whole infiltration gallery and cranked it right up to full noise, it just would have blinded the screens. Right. Any more questions? We had wastewater there, but I'm sorry. We've had wastewater there, but I think we've covered that in stormwater, um, just around the issues that are there. You've seen the tomos that we're trying to repair. A lot of that's just high water table, high volume running through everything. Um, it starts to creep pretty badly, unfortunately. Solid waste. So just while Phil's coming up, um, as you can see from the paper, there were a number of issues across the district from the transfer station at Inner Street um, right through to be our transfer stations on the coast um, and being able to get um, debris and things out. Any questions? Kia ora, everyone. Um, yeah, so as per the report there, you know, our ability to move waste in and out of region got hampered quite quickly with road closures. Um, transfer stations got full pretty quick. I think in the first, well, the first couple of weeks, the first in February itself, there was about 1,600 tonne of waste brought through the transfer station. And then that's a oh, similar volume, a little bit less through the month of March. But, you know, that was, we waived the fees at the gate fees for the transfer station here in town. And we called upon jokes just for the sheer volume that was coming in to take through some of this waste. You can see, you know, people's livelihoods, everything in their home was just taken away. Looking at cars, cars was another one. We were struggling with cars. People had cars full of silt and then the metal recyclers just couldn't take the car because there was too much salt in it. So just trying to work out where that salt would go first. 
get those cleared out before it was disposed of. Um, so people's livelihoods, people's waste, we had lots of volumes of rubbish disposed of on curbsides. Sorry, I'm gonna go back one anyway. Um, people just getting it to the curbside. We enabled our contractors to go out and help remove that waste from the side of people's roads. In a situation like that, it was easier for Fano just to take it, get on the side of the road, and it was sort of done with. There's still piles being left on the side of the road days after we were providing bins and contractors to help that out. Not long after rubbish sort of become less of an issue, silt in and around homes become an issue, and that became part of the mahi that we were doing um, through some funding through uh, NEMA and MFE, banded together with Gisborne, Hawke's Bay and Wairau to try and get some money there that we could enable the recovery of some of that cost that was associated to it. So there was $15 million awarded to the three regions for rubbish removal and silt around the homes. That was only residential properties. Um, so while we've gone in and the crews have been out there pumping through heaps of money to get that silt from around the property. So we followed the insurance company's role of we'll do eight meters around your residential house with investigating and looking how we could potentially do under homes. And that's proven to be really difficult at this stage. So we've trialed out this, what you can see there, a sucker truck come in. There was two different varieties of sucker truck. Um, but, you know, when we're looking at the building inspections, trying to keep those moisture levels down, what's involved there is a, a lot of water to remobilize that silt. So basically, while it's dried out a little bit, which is the pointer, green one. So yeah, well, just in here, it just needs to be quite, quite slushy to actually make it work. Um, and then with the building inspectors doing their testing, it's just not quite viable. So we're looking at other options that we can get to, but again, now it's becoming a cost issue of what it's going to cost for Fano and insurance companies to start removing that from under homes. There's a lot of work involved there. Um, Tokamoto Bay, our transfer station there, the poor transfer station. It's had a hard run with weather events in the recent I'm going to say six months. It's been just continually a major weather event. It's over top and going over the top of the transfer station and starting to, and has been eroding the sort of the riverbank of our transfer station there. The rock revetment wall that was installed after one of our other weather events a couple of years ago that washed away and the one just before Christmas. And so it's just been an ongoing issue there. So we're Pushing, pushing to get that relocation of the transfer station shifted and then remedial works on here with, you know, look at those options, whether it's removal, whether it's more rock revetments, whether it's better rock revetments. But this has just highlighted that, you know, that, that is just an ongoing issue that we're facing at the moment that needs to be done pretty quickly. And it's been pushed through a lot of our funding op options there to try and say, these are our options where we have to go through. So on that, um, the new proposed site, is that still a new, the new proposed site or has that been inundated or was that threatened as well? So speaking with our teams, that new site is still appropriate. Like there was no inundation on that site with the, with the plan to build it up to the level of the sort of paddocks next door. It does give it a good, you know, it stays out of that flood zone. Yeah. Any questions on the side of waste? Councillor Robinson. Um, so the cost of, of all the roadside recovery, uh, roadside removal of, of solid waste, did we end up bearing that or, or who, who picked up the price for that? Who picked up the, so the bill for that? Through you, the Chair, initially we did. We, we, we're paying that, that bill at the moment. There was uh, $15 million from NEMA that came through as a sort of first and best dressed, I'm going to say. Um, application. So those invoices come in, we send it through to NEMA and they will reimburse us up right. to that $15 million. And that's, as I said, for the three regions, Hawke's Bay, Wairau and Tai So we're we looking at 100% recovery on the cost incurred in clearing all that solid waste from the roadsides? Yes. Great. Thank at you. This stage we are.
Well, just quickly, the last couple of papers for Ben's coming up, I'll quickly cover off the wastewater treatment plant. So the big thing to note, the wastewater treatment plant obviously was inundated. Just want to have a huge um, thank you to Tracy and her team with the waste that is coming through the wastewater from sucking out septic tanks and those things, really heavily laden with silt at the moment. So the screens are requiring a heck of a lot of work. Um, and it's it's hard work that they're doing in there to clean those screens. It's very physical. They literally have to get it and try and clean it with water blasters, with chemicals and those things. So think of that silt that comes through from a septic tank. Um, it's been sitting there for a while, mixed in with toilet paper. It basically becomes plaster um, when you chuck it in the grit screen. So amazing job from them. The other thing was their Kiwi ingenuity when it came to the water crisis. Um, we had the McConnell Dow dewatering plant that's been on site there when we were down that deep. So instead of using council water supply for that, they tapped into the groundwater and started using that to run the plant. So mm. they used that with a couple of big bladders down there, which meant they were no draw on the city's water supply, which is no mean feat when they're the third biggest water user in the district. Mm. So it's pretty cool of them to see that sort of ingenuity. Other thing going forward is they're saying, well, that works so well, why don't we look at doing that going forward as well? So if you mm. um, remember the new treatment plant, we can reuse yeah. about two thirds of that water. This new idea they've got now would mean would be 100% pretty much self-sufficient for water. Massive win for the drinking water team, but also for Tairawhiti around we're not using drinking water to clean the wastewater yeah. treatment plant. So really cool to see those guys thinking on their feet um, mm. and one of the kind of unsung hero teams of the thing because they were just doing their thing and doing it well. I got one question I forgot to ask. Um, Dave, years ago, but not that long ago, some I thought there were some bores um, put down in front of Sedinko when we last had a, a water crisis. And I understood they couldn't be used this time around because the city's power supply was severely restricted. We were down to 40 kVA because the substation got swamped in, in Hawke's Bay. Are we back up, is the city back up to full power now? So there's two parts to that. The first part is around the bores and the quality of water that's coming through from there. So we worked really closely with industry around getting food grade water for the likes of Indivin, Sedenko, um, leader brand to be up and running and that's some of the amazing work partnering that we did with them through Diane Murphy and others to take water from leader brands um, plant out at Kings Road but then also taking from our Paritahi water supply as well trucking it into town and being able to, to be used for them to stop the demand on the city's water supply. The issue that everybody had was around having it to drinking water quality standards or food safety act standards they can't take a lot of that bore water and directly put it into their production line or they won't meet their Food Safety Act. So part of it is there. The reason we were also loath to bring in the, if we tapped into the bores, it immediately goes to a boil notice for people. Nobody likes a boil notice because it's really difficult for 38,000 people boiling water. There's a direct correlation to the emergency um, at the hospital getting burns through. So we tried to keep off that, but it wasn't suitable for food safety. When it comes to power, the power lines are back restored um, around the generation that's back to normal. So just the lucky last is um, Sedum. Oh, sorry, Councillor Perry, very well. Thank you, Chair. Just in regards to drinking water and you know, I appreciate all the massive work that's been done to, um, to get the town supply back on. Um, in our rural areas, it was around um, tank supply. Not enough tanks. Heaps of rain coming from the sky. I could have probably filled 10 water tanks with the number of with the amount of water that came from the sky. I guess it's part of our long-term planning discussions, but just to table it here around um, water storage facilities up the coast and into our rural areas are uh, as important as having solutions here in town. Um, so I just wanted to put that, not really for you to answer, but just to, to put that and have that later. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, on that point, um, I know that WINS will give subsidies for water transport up to two or three times a season for coastal families. And I've often thought those payments should be capitalised because after five years of paying for water treatment, water trucking, you've got a water tank value. And maybe it's a conversation we should be having with WINS at some point because if they capitalise those payments, problem solved. I don't know if there's a supplementary something what I'm supposed to say, but <laughs> just in addition to that, I think that's a good point. I mean, to truck water, families are paying $1,000 for half a tank up the top of the coast. 
So mm. that's, you know, yeah. ridiculous. Kia ora. Councillor Oliver. Um, the question I've been asked in case I forget it, but um, going back to page 33, and it's on Operations Committee, Cyclone Gabriel, uh, the council has no option but to secure professional consultants to manage the surge of work. Totally agree. Um, can I ask, when you're employing a consultant, do you negotiate the price? Is it a tender cost, or do you just get a surprise at the end of it? And what are your thoughts on having total transparency around the cost of the consultant's report for councillors and council staff? Uh, through you, Chair, I'll answer the first two parts to that question. Um, so when we have any of our professional service suppliers, they all have to be done through council's procurement policies and practices. So that is either for a discrete piece of work, we will put out either an expressions of interest or request for proposals that they will then tender. We will look at the rates um, and it will then be done on price, um, experience, methodology, all of those things for a piece of work. For a lot of the work that we do, we have panel supplies, particularly for the likes of roading, where we've got, as you can imagine, a number of bridges, geotech, those things, where the panel gets put out every couple of years, people can apply for it. They, we then negotiate rates based on the volume of works coming through and the skills and experience of the people that have been put through. So all of those are put yeah. out openly, they are tended for, and they go from there. For all of the packages of work, they have to provide a quote. There's no open-ended um, works that we have in any type in Lifeline. So it has to be for a fixed term quote. Mm -hmm. They will be up to a limit. Nobody has a away you go kind of thing. A lot of our spend is done through our annual plan reporting at the end of the year. So in our annual plan, you'll see where our spends are for things that have gone through from there. Councillor Branson. Yeah, with the bar trickling bar, if it gets through the filter and into the tank itself, is that sufficient to keep that really going at its best? Like the bugs and beasties are all okay with it and all that sort of thing? Or it doesn't adhere to the plastic stuff? So through the wastewater treatment plant, um, the first point of contact is through the grit screens, which takes out a lot of the grit. Uh, sorry, the five mil screens, the big washing machine kind of tumbler process. It then goes through a grit vortex screen. So I think a number of you have stood on top of it. It's basically where we have the wastewater spinning around in a circle and the grit goes um, through the outside, falls out, we collect that. The clean water goes through to the BTF, so it's cleanish. We The volume of stuff that we've got going through is fine. Natural stuff, silt, sediment, we flush. So we increase the water pressure to push it down through so we can flush the BTF quite easily. Um, basically, those bugs that are in there are fine with anything that is organic. It's the inorganics that can shock the system. So if someone illegally dumps large amounts of chemicals, that's when we have problems with the BTF. But it can handle anything that's going through at the moment. When it comes to sediment load and silt, the only caveat on that is Tracy and the team very much will be talking with the waste operators as to what's coming through and we'll dose it at different times of the day to try and align their delivery with water volumes and flows that we've got coming through. We wouldn't, we wouldn't be comfortable taking a large volume of silt laden stuff at a low flow period during the day. So they work through with the operators to make sure that we've got enough flow on plant for it to be able to dilute what's coming through. Yeah. Right. Oh. Ben's been doing nothing. He's just been cruising. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. So, can I take Ben's report. Is there anything you want to highlight, mate? Kia ora, uh, Tato. And um, yeah, I'll just run through. I've obviously taken the report as read. It's very much a high level synopsis uh, with the event. Probably, I, I think one thing to highlight is with particularly Gabrielle, it's the only third time New Zealand's activated a national declaration. So you put that in context of the, the scope, scale, and complexity of the event. And equally for us as a region, personally, for my involvement, would exceed probably 15 to 16 severe weather events in terms of dealing with what I've uh, certainly been uh, discharged with in, in my role uh, since being here for the last two and a half years. So I, I guess the uh, scope and scale for um, particularly Cycling Gabrielle, there's 
probably no one within the 50,000 plus people within this region that are, haven't been directly or indirectly infected by the, the impact of the event. And of course, um, much as vindicated by Dave earlier, uh, we're still very much, even as of this morning, uh, dealing with Fano who are yet to have restored access. So that really in, in, in turn incurs welfare uh, requirement to support, and that's still we have pockets of people in that capacity. And those directly impacted within the obviously red and yellow sticker uh, process, which is pretty pretty um, stressful in, in any any event and occasion. Uh, also, balance the figures in terms of what you see with the red and yellow stickers that we have the previous uh, home or households that have yet to be remediated from our previous events. So that's a figure we'll bring through because it's uh, certainly presents more in terms of what we, we track in, in terms of specifically for Gabriel event. Um, I'd certainly like to just highlight really as a region, the complexity with the event and, and what we go through for our readiness. And my team is very much back into readiness, really getting ready for the next events. Uh, we're heading into winter. And obviously the start state we have is a very fragile uh, set of infrastructure, much of you've, you've spent with the my colleagues and Dave going through in terms of where things are at, what degree of repair, and, and really for the most part, the emergency level of repair is not fully restored to being resilient in terms of the way we'd actually ideally like to see that. Um, however, we are, some of the pluses we've seen of this is really the, uh, we've seen community in, in terms of self-activation. There's more groups within the mix now that uh, I guess the, not so much the realization, but the requirement uh, to form, to come together and be supported to be part of an integrated framework. And that, uh, you know, as much as we're dealing with iwi in the sense that we have always done there, there's opportunities, I think, within the context of moving forward that we'll be looking to uh, further develop and, and go with that process. Equally resourcing uh, with various community groups, the way that people can get that to enhance really their own community or really in, in indirectly the region, uh, that certainly is certainly come to the fore as well. Um, and really at the end of the day, if someone can shake the tree and Putia comes out of it, you're going to shake the tree and you keep shaking it because it's something we're not eminently resourced for, but really our role is to help be the consolidator, the connector, the facilitator and equally how we then partner with the aspect to, to support our communities for that. Uh, we very much have, uh, particularly with the event, I did mention the tail and, and the tail being particularly the ongoing uh, welfare support. So you'd see a table in there, which is the inserted into the back of my report, which was the snapshot for the provisional welfare uh, support uh, over the event. So when you see 15.2 thousand people engaged with you, you're looking at over 30% 30, 30 of your region has in, at some point formally engaged into a welfare or monarchy process. And from that, really the sub-functional welfare has been dealing with it. Obviously beyond that now, as, you, as we're back into the aspect of uh, agency BAU, or the provision of uh, services within the context of we've moved from response to recovery. There's, there's still quite a significant, obviously, uptake for uh, wealthy payments trying to engage with the, we'll navigate through the EQC process for, for many, and uh, dealing with impacts of limited or very tenuous sort of aspects to roading and access and the economic, obviously, downstream from that for forestry, agriculture, and, and equally just people trying to get from A to B with work. So it certainly uh, has been, uh, it's been a big event. I did say that un unfortunately for us, it is just another event of a bigger scale. And the upside of that is we, much as we lead it to these, we, we're more than prepared, certainly in terms of getting ready for these uh, from the at least 72 plus hours out. And that uh, we're very actively involved in uh, dealing with our uh, debriefing process directly with our community groups. And that's only just started. It's yet to capture everybody, but um, regardless of whether they did a job, there's a hundred percent and it's a pat on the back. We'd still be looking for that something that is something to improve there. And I, I know that we, we've, we've got things there that uh, we certainly will be looking to enhance. And that's really the opportunity to make sure that we better reconfigure for next time. Uh, so yeah, happy to take any questions or Councillor Robinson. 
Thanks, Ben. Um, thank you for all the effort you personally have put in and your team has put in. Um, Starter response, an incredible event. Um, you've just talked about learnings a little bit there, and I was quite keen to see in the briefing what the plan was around a review. The only bit I could find was bottom of page 39, which talked about embarking on after action reviews with community link groups. Is that what you mean by a review of yes. response? Yes. Okay, so what I, what I need to hear, please, is that there is going to be a formal response review, and I want some time frames. I want to know when that's going to be in by, and I want to know who you're going to speak to, and I want to know if it's going to be independently audited or mandated or, or run, because there have been a number of queries and concerns and issues raised by people in the community about different aspects of what took place in the response. And it's really critical in my, from my view that we, that we respond accordingly to that. So um, what's the plan, please? Um, through the chair, so we hadn't intended on undertaking an independent review like in that case that has happened in Auckland, and I think Hawke's Bay is undertaking their own. Um, we know that there were not significant failures in terms of our response. We're very comfortable with that. Um, we've got a independent coming through with the chronological of our timeframes along with what um, Mr. Green has been doing by way of debriefs. There's also our own debrief that we're carrying out and that will get feedback up to the CEDM group, but I had no intention of undertaking an independent review unless otherwise directed by council to do so. Okay, well, that, that answers, answers one aspect of my question. So no independent review, but what's the plan for the rest of the review? So by the SEDM group uh, meeting, which is May 25, uh, Mr. Green will have compiled the data from his um, debriefs that have been undertaken alongside with NEMA. So NEMA have been part of facilitating the um, debrief process. We'll also have the timelines and the actions that took place from our um, independent to present to the SEDM group in May. Is there the ability for the community who, who don't fall under those auspices to feed into this process? How is this going to be captured? Uh, so that's going through uh, the recovery processes. We work through a collective impact um, meeting methodology, which Anita can talk to about what that means. Uh, so the collective impact methodology is a whānau based approach to, um, to how we engage with the community um, and um, we have Jean Takarua who is leading that particular component of it and he's working across um, the agencies in Tairāpiti to ensure that there is a one voice that is um, the face of government when we go out to engage with the community. So we will be able to gather from that feedback in terms of the response leading into recovery um, type plans for uh, whānau and community. And is that anticipated that will be undertaken by the 25th of May? So what sort of timeframes are we talking about? Because we know, we know the cycle of how people respond generally. There's the There's the adrenaline, there's a response, we're all happy, and then three months later, as the Ombudsman said the other day when he visited us, out comes anger and frustration and et cetera, et cetera. So I'd like to know the timeframes that we anticipate capturing these voices, letting people tell their stories, and then giving meaningful feedback and, and whatever we can learn from it. Um, through the chair, so within the next two weeks, we will have um, a more defined uh, to how we will roll this out. In the meantime, we're working with agencies to ensure that we have a collective approach and that we are um, understanding of our roles and responsibilities in that um, methodology. Um, so the, the thing with this is that it is not a just a recovery um, approach. It's a long, um, enduring approach to how we go out as, a, as, as um, central, as, as government agencies. Um, with the region, so it won't be included in the 25th of May, um, but uh, it will be happening within the next couple of weeks. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, Council Parata. Sorry, um, I haven't had you on the screen for part of this presentation, so I don't know, you might have a lot of questions from 
previous one. So well, might... it's okay. I, I purposely left it to the rest of the counselors to ask the hard hitting questions when you couldn't see me. Yeah. But now I'm back. <laughs> Um, thank you, Ben, for, for your update um, and for the mahi you and your team have done. Um, I'm aware of the debriefs happening um, within the communities, and I've also been part of the Ngāti Pau, um debriefs um, that we've been conducting on our own um, in terms of the civil defence space. Um, and I'm aware of some of the issues that particularly facing Te Paraka. Um, so while I think a debrief is a good idea, what I want to understand is how do you rebuild relationships where trust has been broken? And that's the conversation that we're having. There's a mistrust there for the communities that sit outside of Tūranga Nui Akiwa, um, that when things get tough, it seems that the smaller communities that sit further outside the centre are forgotten. And whether that's true or not true, that is the feeling from the local SEDEM teams. Um, so, so kind of my question is, how do you build that relationship and how do you build trust, knowing that more than likely we're about to face yet another um, another crisis of this kind? Thank you. Um, kia ora, Councillor Parata. Just in terms of building that trust again, so there are a couple of things in this, and this is why we haven't gone rushing straight out in terms of community debriefs, because firstly, everyone's... A, you know, quite emotional over the last few events. Uh, and actually, actually, I have to keep my staff safe at the same time in terms of their emotional well-being too. So I don't want to put them in the firing line when we haven't had an opportunity to also be really clear about the events and how they unfolded with the dates and stuff. Because there are there is some misinformation that is circulating around what has happened and our role that we played in that. And so we want to be able to present that information to the SEDEM group and the way so that we're all on board about what actually happened and how those events unfolded. Um, we do then need to go out there at a time, and that's what Anita's been alluding to, just working through a process around when is the right time um, to do that. We have, uh, for Te Karaka, as an example, we have been in constant contact with uh, Robin, um, Rona and Waliti Aho in trying to support and offer ourselves and our staffs available to their community hui, which they do not want us there at this stage. So we will just be ready um, to respond when they do want us to to do so. So it is about time. It is also about making sure that we're all on the same page as a council around what um, the events that unfolded with the civil defence through the information that will be provided. Um, and then also making sure that we're linking in so we're not just going out there with the response um, debrief recorded all but that we've actually got a plan going forward, um, working with the community on what they want in terms of their priorities. Well, I just wanted to acknowledge um, acknowledge that, that approach about keeping our staff safe and about the fact that it is high emotion um, out there and, and um, I appreciate the leadership um, from our CE and from our directors and from the controller himself, keeping the staff safe. Um, as a community member, we want that. We want everyone to be, be safe and we want us all to be able to contribute to the next great event. Um, so just ngā mihi for that response. I just wanted to respond to um, Council Robinson. Uh, we are able to feed into that um, to that survey that um, the Civil Defence have sent out. We had a link sent the other day, uh, whereupon we can give uh, what feedback we've heard and are concerned about. Um, so that's available to us too. Um, you're getting them, <laughs> Councillor Foster. So I'm doing this so you can practice saying my name lots. The um, uh, thank you, Ben, and, and you know, fully appreciate all of the mahi. I know it's hard in there, and I, but I just want to support Councillor Parata and her concerns. Um, we both, um, I guess you know. We sit in a lot of spaces and a lot of places and we are hearing from all over the community um, the concerns over the response. And we know things are contentious as well um, uh, in our every space. And I guess here at this table, wanting to know, you know, we want to be able to support moving forward. Um, I wanted to pick up on what Councillor um, Gregory was saying as well about the, the survey. So 
um, and also encourage our councillors to fill that out because it's it's an opportunity for us to be involved and I appreciate that we have had a, an opportunity to be involved in that way um, and, and be able to be frank and, and honest about uh, what we're hearing out there and um, uh, I look forward to seeing the what that looks like and whilst we're going through some rough times at the moment I think at the end of it it will be uh, well prepared I did have one a question about the again about the emergency containers um, the gear the tents the and everything else that we are still waiting for um, that's been a, a massive concern that they're yet to arrive um, so can you give us an ETA please yeah uh, and total talk with it I think certainly and I'll just talk the containers uh, but I'll make the comment that these are very traumatic and equally emotive events and I, I think the, the critical bit much as uh, David and Dean initiated is to actually get context in fact in there which is um, at the moment people are feeling what they've felt and they've, they've gone through something of the magnitude and scales that indicate it's the third time in New Zealand's history we've activated a national declaration so really and, and but accepting that communities really they're, they're very much uh, very centric in terms of what happened to us in this in the context of our small community and it's about you know us and I accept that but really in terms of the complexity and scale of a region-wide event where every one of our 50,000 plus, uh, you know, whanau within the whole rohi have been impacted. That's probably where we're starting it. And, but we'll take that through. As I say, there's nothing to hide. The bits we own, we're much as we've always done. And as I say, I've done this 16 times before. I don't think we're failing in terms of massive ways. It's the complexity and scale that bring out really the, the only way you can stress test these is to actually you, you identify what you do for the lessons learned process. So it's a positive uh, process that we engage with and uh, certainly won't shy away from that. And in terms of the containers, that obviously just with the uh, reforming of our, uh, just uh, with, with our iwi and our say our iwi with the Funati Pro, uh, that wānanga ready for the rollout, it was uh, meant to happen in uh, week two of March. And obviously we're still very much in response there. Uh, so that very much has got a reset date for that. And I'm actually down there, uh, well, sorry, Friday afternoon to get down with uh, Dr. Pro in terms of the configuration fit out for what we have got in the plan for deployment there. So it's not, which is the aspect that's certainly led in the project sense by myself, but certainly in the partnered sense of logistics and planning, that's with a, with the group that makes up our, our ROPU for that. And we really want to get that back on because we, we've got obviously winter coming and equally, you know, we have changed from a La Nina into an El Nino. So it's not a case of water, water everywhere. It'll be probably a different scenario for next year. So your water conversation, I think in either context is either going to be too much or not enough. And I'd like to think that next year it's not enough, but that comes with the downside as well. All right, um, Councillor Robinson. Oh, uh, Councillor Telfer, sorry. Yeah, um, Ben, uh, thanks, Ben. Look, I know um, that the whole, this whole thing has been pretty stressful on everybody, and especially yourselves, um, having to deal with the cold face. But I, I think just going forward, and I think maybe where um, Tony's coming from as well, is I just think that um, as part of a debrief of this, we need to look at a debrief as a learning thing. What what do we think worked well, and what do we, can we do better? So. I'd just like the councillors around this table to be involved at some stage around that to be able to have a really good discussion because we we arrived here on day one. What do we do? And look, you know, there's not really wasn't really a place from you know I got told I can go and deliver newspapers around. So I just think when we're getting, unfortunately, we get all the phone calls come at us saying you know this is happening. We're not getting anyone to respond to us and it's trying to link that up somehow how we can maybe deal with that a bit better as part of the process um and the other one i just thought um and dave you mentioned it before around the comms you know you had something going in the newspaper regarding the drain and stuff i think that's probably an area we can maybe do a bit better so as part of this um debrief do people out there all know that that's happening and um how do they you know, not everyone just goes on the website to see something. Um, maybe we could use the radio. Um, not everyone gets the newspaper now. We've just had our uh, rural delivery cancelled for some various reasons. I don't know what's going on there. But um, 
So uh, maybe the radio can be used a bit more to let people know, hey, this is what feedback can, can go to wherever it needs to go. I, I think if people, I think the comms thing is what's been missing a little bit right through the whole thing um, with a whole lot of areas is if people know that there's a plan, then they'll, they'll probably want to sit back and just wait for it to happen. Sure. Um, just to answer that, I mean, we did have a very comprehensive plan, and Rahit was on the radio. And Rahit was on the radio twice daily. We had, as you say, um, electronic uh, social media. Um, when the comms went down, we um, allocated a Starlink to the Gisborne Herald, and we were running messages between this office and that office to ensure that the information we got out. Delivery of the the newspapers was a volunteer. Um, uh, uh, approach because we knew that we needed to uh, um, get to the community and to do that we needed the best coverage that we possibly could using the mediums that we were, had available which were you know that just lack of comms um, ability to use our normal channels so we were in a position to be able to communicate with the community as widely as we possibly could but um, take on uh, on board your advice and if there's any sort of further suggestions we were also putting up posters and you know we, we were at that sort of very very raw um, level in terms of the detail around how we communicated. Councillor Robinson. Um, I, I think I mean Rob's mirrored my point but I think the point is that if we if we actually went out to the community, and I don't think we have, but if we went out to the community and said, we're actually doing a, a debrief, we want to hear your stories. Here's, here's where you can feed your stories in. Because I carry dozens, uh, Rob has shared with me that hundreds he carries. And I'm sure many of us here carry other stories. Um, we can't just be the conduit for feeding that back in. And I think we need to go out to the community if we haven't already and say, we are doing a formal, CDM's doing a formal debrief. Here are the channels for feeding back in. Here's the website, here's the link, here's however. Um, Madam CE, through the chair, um, you spoke just before about um, Robin and Willie saying, you know, don't come out to TK, we'll let you know when we're ready. But I've had feedback from Patatutu Pua community and from 300 metres shy of the township of people who experience a really, um, in their view, inappropriate and, and um, below par response. And um, and they their voice is not being heard, they're not being captured. So. Um, how we open that door and, and just as, as Ben said, with nothing to hide, welcome your feedback and we're going to have learnings from this and it'll come out in this time frame. That's, that's what I'm really wanting to make sure we're doing. Yes, through the chair again. So we are going to do that. It's about getting our ducks lined up. I said that we were going to make sure that the timing is right as well to be able to go out with information needs because what we don't want to do is go out and there's nothing meaningful that we can engage with we will be out there at this stage where again emotions are high getting a beat up and I'm not going to put my staff in that at this stage we will go out when the time is right but what I refer to is that we have made ourselves available also for the community for Mahaki and they are leading that and they've been very clear that they don't want us to be in there at this stage but we've said we are here and available for anyone but in terms of an organized community debrief of that kind that, it, that will happen, it's just not going to happen next week. We're just going to work through the timings when that's right. And we'd like to be able to do that when we've got our um, information back from our consultants around that aggregates all the actions and timeframes as they unfolded through the event. Right, thank you. I'd just like to acknowledge um, your team, Ben. Um, great work, you know, there's been a lot of pressure and um, yeah, it's been um, it's a big shout out to you and your team. You know, they've done a fantastic job. And same with Dave. You know, um, this this report that we've got had here today is absolutely incredible. And, you know, we've gone through some all the different um, areas and seen what um, the recovery is looking like, the work that's gone into um, upgrading bridges and roads as fast as possible. So you know, this has been put so much pressure on our team and. Uh, you know, I've just a big heads up. They've um, done extremely well. And Anita, with all the reporting from the recovery, fantastic. So, you know, keep up the great work. I know it's been really tiring and um, hard going, but, uh, you know, it's um, everyone is, a lot of people are really beneficial and really happy with um, the response that's been happening. Rhonda. 
tina tina koe pen uh, me o mahirahi e hara iti mahi ngāwari e hara iti mahi māma roko hanga ko te ngangau a te iwi anō i runga iā koe me tā mātou mōhio ko tau wa ngangau ka hoki iho mai ki roto iā koe he o te whenua tonu ne. Um, so I just wanted to say I really acknowledge um, the responsibility you had in the midst of our civil defence emergency as our controller, the space that everybody looks forward to, the leadership to. Um, thank you. Thank you on behalf of all of us. Um, leadership is not easy, that's why not everybody does it. So kaitimihia tu. And also too, as a tangata whenua, as a ngāti pro, um, as a person whose whakapapa is 46 generations deep to this land, thank you. Uh, even when sometimes uh, the calls are really hard and it can feel like people are thankless, still say thank you. Someone has to do that difficult job. Um, my question uh, is, where does the role of the Civil Defence Emergency Management Committee of GDC fit in relation to what we've just experienced? My reason for asking is that um, in our recent discussions, it's become clear that pulling out of RTRO pulls us back to CEDAM, the Act itself. And therefore, in my assumption, it would be at that committee governance level. Um, I want to understand what are the functional relationships with these sets of machinery. Um, one, because I'm new to understanding the machinery, and I'm sure there are others here too. And two, so that I um, might understand where the levelling is in terms of um, rank, file, and chain and command. Kia ora. Thank you. Um, Kia ora. Uh, through, through the chair, I will respond to that relationship because um, fundamentally the CEDAM group has always been in established. So it's the Civil Defence Emergency Management Group is a requirement of the Civil Defence Emergency Management Act. And that requirement is on all local authorities to have a group. Um, and unlike in the other areas where you have Hawke's Bay, um, Napier, Wairau, Hawke's Bay Central, um, there are in Hastings, there are five councils that make up their group and they are the mayors from each of those councils. And the regional councils are the hosts for civil defence emergency management groups. Since we are unitary, we're one and the same. So councillors are the civil defence emergency management group. And that group has got resp particular responsibilities to um, set the st strategy uh, and uh, strategic direction for the Tairawhiti group plan. And that group plan, uh, which is a little bit out of date at the moment because we've been waiting for the legislation to uh, be amended, but basically it sets out all the rules, roles, procedures, uh, or standard operating procedures uh, for how you respond in an emergency, um, in a civil defence emergency state of, state, or state of national emergency, our relationship to NEMA, um, the relationship to our coordinating executive group, which is effectively uh, myself and the other chief executives from across the region that are supposed to provide you with advice and guidance in that plan, within which Ben, uh, as a controller, will implement and adhere to, um, noting that when we are in a national state of emergency, he doesn't report to uh, anyone in council, he reports to the national uh, emergency controller. Similarly, in the state of emergency, Ben doesn't report to anyone. Uh, he, I have no powers over um, Ben as a group controller. So that relationship with RTRO, there, there was none. There is none. So RTRO was born um, by myself and Hirawini Te Koha, created that as a way of collaborating when we had COVID-19 and bringing together all the plans of our region under one so we could get some funding um, to be able to support our community because it was a whole lot of loss of jobs. That has not ever activated in an adverse weather event situation. In adverse weather event situations of which we've had many, we have always ran it as civil defence and under the civil defence group. So that's that relationship. There isn't really none. It's just kind of what's changed in the situation is because there was a national state of emergency, there was a thought that that model that was stood up back then might be relevant here, but it's not the BAU. The BAU of council is 
responding to these weather events, right? So there's that, and it comes with powers and all the other stuff that you have in a regimented type um, defense orientated system, really. Um, and then the second question was the role of the group. Um, so yeah, so the role is specifically around guiding us in that plan, um, the group plan at the high level, um, being kept informed through the information that we feed up. I've heard the concerns or the, not even the concerns really, it's about how do we tap into the expertise and reach and advocacy of the elected members around the table. And actually the group plan also will identify the roles that council look, council laws will have, can play. So that's really the, the main point is making sure that that plan's set and that we are delivering to that plan. And that when there are adverse weather events or state of emergencies, if you want us to do an independent review or that will question our, the stuff that we do by way of bringing back the debrief and lesson learned, that's the place that that gets debated as well and discussed. Again, with the supplementary, thank you, Tina Gwete Manahautu, for bringing the flesh to the bones. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so helpful, so very helpful. Um, the two supplementary points that I want to raise in that is um, the value of having a workshop so that all of us can actually understand the depth of what you discussed and what is the plan and what is this process so that we can become agentic in discussing to our stakeholder supporters about how this works to assist further um, with the comms planning that um, is done already by the by the GDC, kia ora. Um, and the second one was to ask, I think I remember hearing some time ago that our civil defence was meant to have its own operational functioning building. And I'm wondering, uh, I know that we're still in recovery <laughs> in response, is that anywhere in the space so that it can have its own dedicated space, uh, knowing that it's, you know, going to be tenuous with La Lina, La whatever <laughs> coming? Um, so those are my questions. Thank you. So the ACC Ben can't wait to get into. So that is under construction at the moment. Yes. So is that new time frame, July? Uh, ready to move into at least in the physical building since next month, uh, mm -hmm. mid May. And Perfect. civil works, uh, probably another couple of weeks on top of that. All right, um, we'll uh, wind this little part up now and we'll go into public excluded after lunch. We'll have lunch first and then um, straight after that, we'll go into uh, public excluded. So thank you everyone so far um, for what we've done this morning. Actually awesome. Thank you. Yeah, better. <laughs> um, have I got a mover? Moved by... Councillor Robinson, seconded by Councillor Cranston. All those in favour?